Hi, Catherine. I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. Can you hear me? Scott, I can't hear her either. Okay. okay. I, can I can hear, hear you. you. Just a little bit, very faintly. Okay. One of my technology was unplugged. Okay. Yeah, you're getting the voice is coming in stronger now. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think the owl is finally starting to warm up. <laughs> it's been a cold week so far. It's been very cold. So I've uh, I've made you co-host, so we're ready to go. Okay, I've got the owl now. So are you ready to go? Yes. Okay. All right, well, good evening, everybody. And welcome to a cold, snowy February, I guess. I'm also gonna hand out the homework for the vegetable class, which is kind of a little overdue to hand out, but that's okay. And and I'm also going to hand out kind of a template for the vegetable class, and it's vegetable garden log. I'll talk about that later. So, but my trick is to try to necessarily hit all the right buttons. Thank 
Just barely, Catherine. Okay. Um, I'll turn this over to you and the class and see if I can't get the owl to be a little louder. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, while you work on that technology, uh, I will um, uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, uh, as Catherine probably told you, I'm the extension entomology specialist, and uh, that part of my duties is uh, being the diagnostician for samples that uh, the general public and master gardeners and extension educators and farmers, uh, ranchers, uh, just about anybody can submit uh, a sample of an arthropod, doesn't have to be an insect, and I'll explain a little bit more about the differences between the these critters, but tonight we're going to concentrate on uh, the insects, that that class of arthropods, and then because um, uh, they're probably the most important of the uh, arthropods and have a big impact, both positive and negative, uh, for people who are interested in growing plants like yourselves. <clears throat> Now, I've, I've been doing this job since uh, 2003, this particular position, and uh, uh, worked with Catherine for a lot of years so, uh, uh, with uh, teaching as uh, part of this course and, and of course, uh, also uh, uh, helping her with any samples that she, she normally handles them herself. But So tonight, we're not really going to talk about control. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, you can... Uh, uh, do the raise your hand thing or um, uh, put it in the chat. That might be the easiest if you're uh, viewing this remotely. I am sorry that uh, I, I'm getting to be a big chicken about I-80. I have had some bad experiences on that road and and uh, I know Cheyenne, uh, it would, probably wouldn't have been too bad getting over there. Uh, the wind kind of died down this afternoon, but it might have been hard to get back. And, I actually grew up north of Cheyenne and I saw the I-25 north of Cheyenne has been closed all day and I remember those times. I can get my slides to advance. What's going on with this? There we go. <clears throat> all right, so as I said, we're going to talk about insects and the um, they are uh, the largest group of organisms on earth. Uh, they, uh, more than a million species have been described to science, and the definition of species that I'm using is uh, where individuals of uh, one kind are, uh, mate and produce fertile offspring. Now, with insects, that's always kind of, uh, they, they're full of exceptions to the rules because, uh, as you may know, some insects uh, uh, like uh, black vine weevil or uh, Russian weed aphid, uh, they do all the reproduction parthenogenically, so asexual. So uh, it, they're all little clones of each other. <clears throat> but other insects, uh, if we define them as species, you know, they're distinct kinds. Just think of it that way. And we divide the class insecta, and I'll talk more about this taxonomy stuff uh, in a little bit into the major orders. And a lot of these have common names that you're probably very familiar with, like beetles or butterflies and moths and the bees, ants, wasps, and sawflies and true flies, those types of things. And they certainly dominate. Uh, and if you compare that to the other 
creatures that have been described as science, other invertebrates, things without backbone, about uh, 310,000 plants, 289,000. Of course, the plant diversity ties in with insect diversity because there's, uh, uh, when you think about a plant, there can be insects that are specialized on feeding from its roots to its crown and all parts in between, and then predators that are specialized into feeding on them and so on and so forth. So that's part of the reason why insects are so diverse. And then things with backbones like ourselves and other mammals and uh, uh, fish and birds and things like that, <clears throat> about 60,000 of them, and then other life, bacteria and fungi. Uh, at the time, the reference that I uh, looked at was about 176,000 described to science. So what distinguishes an insect from other arthropods? So you may have had this in the past in a science class, but uh, if we look at uh, these three organisms here, so this is a uh, male Rocky Mountain wood tick, and it has a one part body. And as an adult or the, the, uh, the, the nymphal stage, the one before it becomes an adult, it has eight legs and it, they never have wings despite what some of my friends have said, the, the ticks must be flying because they got on me. So, uh, uh, nope, they, they, they never have wings. <laughs> and then another large group of arthropods uh, are the spiders. And so they have a two-part body. They have a head and thorax combined. And that is where all eight of their legs originate from. And then they have an abdomen. And then we have the insects. Now, some insects are harder to see than others, but this, this uh, yellow jacket queen, she is easy to see the parts that uh, diagnose, the diagnostic characters uh, that make her an insect. So uh, you see her head, her thorax, and her abdomen. And of course, she has wings. And then she has six legs as an adult. Now, Immature insects, they can vary very widely from uh, the, this body plan, but this is the basic one for, uh, and you, you'll see quite a few pictures of grasshoppers in my presentations, because uh, that's my favorite family of insects are the grasshoppers. And uh, you, you probably can't maybe make it out too well on this. I don't know if uh, Professor Stump has given a presentation on plant pathology, but uh, a long time ago, he, he's a very talented scientific illustrator and he uh, worked on a book called The Common Western Grasshoppers for Dr. Robert Fott, who was an expert at on grasshoppers at the university. So anyway, so here we go. Uh, the other thing I maybe didn't mention is insects have antennae. Now, some insects don't have very big antennae because they don't use it very much. Others have very prominent antennae. And uh, again, you know, uh, you can see this head, thorax, and the thorax, uh, these segments are where the legs and wings originate and then the abdomen. So the reason why I'm emphasizing this is if you're trying to identify something uh, using an insect reference and it's not an insect, you're gonna have a hard time. So uh, these are, th this, this is a, a major step. First thing, is this an insect or is this a mite uh, or is this a, a, you know, possibly a, a spider or is this an immature insect? <clears throat> now we're, that's, a whole, that's a whole semester class in itself but uh, we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit. So in Wyoming, you know, we have a fairly harsh climate and we often think of insects because their major activity is during the warmer months of the year that maybe we don't have many insects. We don't have much diversity. Well, we don't as compared to places like the tropics perhaps, but um, if uh, the best guesses, because we haven't cataloged everything that lives in Wyoming, but through sampling and statistics, uh, it's been estimated between 10 and 15,000 different species of insects live in Wyoming. So if you compare that to the total number of mammal species that have been described on earth, that's a, they're only about 4,400. So uh, it, it's quite a challenge to identify some of these creatures, especially the ones that are very small, and a lot of the ones that say live underground. 
in soil. You know, the, I don't know if you've had the, the soil class yet, but really the soil is alive. There's lots and lots of little arthropods that live in soil. Uh, and, and so those are tougher to uh, figure out what's there. Uh, insects also uh, outnumbers. It's been estimated there are about 200 million insects to each person on Earth. Uh, and, and sometimes in your garden, if you've got grasshoppers or some other pests, you might agree with that. On average, uh, of course, averages are uh, you know, kind of iffy, but uh, it's been estimated that there's 40 million insects on each acre of arable land in, in the world. And in the US, if you gathered up all the insects in, in the continental US and, and divided that by the area, uh, there'd be about 400 pounds of them per acre, whereas human biomass, if they gathered us all up and, and divided us by the same area, it'd only be 14 pounds. So they're very numerous. Why are insects so successful? Why have they been so successful through time? Part of it is, uh, you know, their physical characteristics, such as the ability to fly, like this illustration here. These are uh, 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 the um, migratory locusts in West Africa that uh, my uh, old boss and friend, uh, Professor Alex Lachininski took a picture of, uh, showing a swarm of them flying. Uh, so that ability to uh, spread out and occupy new habitats is very valuable for success and long-term uh, uh, survival. Insect exoskeletons. So their exoskeleton is very different than ours. When you think of a small insect, they have a lot of surface area compared to their volume. And so then they uh, would shed moisture and dry out very rapidly. You know, if you've ever put a rubber glove on, you realize how much moisture vapor is just coming off our skin all the time. We don't realize it. And insects would rapidly dehydrate. So they have to have that ability. It's protective and it's also waterproofing. This is why things like uh, diatomaceous earth or, or uh, uh, silica air gels, uh, they disrupt the waterproofing on the insect exoskeleton and cause them to dehydrate. <clears throat> Uh, small size is actually an advantage too. You don't require a lot of, of uh, calories, uh, food calories. And of course, they're also uh, cold blooded. And now uh, that's a term that, that yeah, insects actually can manipulate their body once, say, the sun comes up to warm it up to the ideal uh, point. And then uh, in some cases, when we were trying to use insect pathogens to perhaps control them, they can actually raise their body beyond what would normally be ideal for them in a fever, fever response. It's called behavioral fever. They'll bask in the sunlight and raise it up to the point to try to kill the pathogen and, and, and cure themselves. <clears throat> They don't know that, that's just instinctive, but uh, <clears throat> reproductive capacity. Some insects are, uh, have a, a great capacity to pr produce offspring and you're more likely to have some survive. Uh, there's all sorts of variations from uh, things like uh, aphids, which uh, have the ability to reproduce uh, asexually and uh, at certain times for species, they'll be producing offspring that are already forming the next generation within them. So they can have you know, uh, over 15 generations in a single growing season. Uh, uh, conversely, there are other species, say like uh, the sheep kid, uh, where they uh, put a lot of resources into raising one internally. It's more, you can almost think of it like a pregnancy. So they have the egg uh, uh, and then it, it, the larva develops within the body of the adult uh, sheep kid. And then uh, when it's ready to pupate, she produces it out and glues it onto the um, uh, wool of a sheep. And then it transforms into the adult there. <laughs> uh, so very... Uh, wide range of, of variation with insects. And of course, very important for master gardeners is that relationship with plants. Because when the flowering plants came into the fossil record, that is also when the insect fauna started to diversify and become abundant and diverse. Now are all insects or bugs evil? Uh, 
the more you know about them, like anything, the more you know about it, then, then there's less to be frightened of. Uh, if you looked at this initially, you would see that it looks like it has warning coloration, uh, and it does, but it's a bluff. Uh, it, this uh, is a male scorpion fly, and that is just a structure for mating. It can't sting, and they have uh, rather small, weak chewing mouth parts. They, they actually will feed on um, a small, soft-bodied insects such as aphids. So <clears throat> it, it, they're not necessarily evil. Now, some are uh, pretty fearsome and can be annoying, such as the uh, yellow jackets, uh, which uh, in North America, nine times out of 10, uh, when people uh, <clears throat> say they were stung by a bee, it was actually yellow jackets. Of course, if you've ever watched cartoons as a kid, you might note that they often portrayed uh, honeybees is, you know, bright black and yellow. Well, as you may, you, you probably know now, they are not that. Uh, and so uh, yellow jackets, especially the ground nesting ones that are scavengers are the are responsible for most uh, uh, stings. And then we also have pests uh, that have been uh, adapted to living with us for eons of time. And this is a, an adult bed bug. And then this is the very first stage out of the egg of a bed bug. They all feed on blood. And, and so they are, they, some of the insects, uh, uh, you know, even, even entomologists have a hard time finding any uh, soft spot in their heart for them. And hey, then Scott, of course, yes. We've, I got a question here, PJ. I was wondering, are So, Scott, I, did you hear that? Uh, I couldn't hear. Could you repeat it for me, Catherine? Are, are yellow jackets attracted to meat? Yeah, the ground nesting ones, the western yellow jacket, uh, prairie yellow jacket. Uh, some people call them uh, meat bees uh, uh, in the fall. Uh, well, late summer and fall, uh, either at picnics, they'll come in and try to steal uh, meat uh, in, that's being prepared to go on the barbecue or even off your plate. Uh, and then um, uh, hunters, uh, that's where a lot of times they'll call them meat bees uh, out on the prairie. It'd be prairie yellow jacket. And there's also species that live in uh, the forest that are also scavengers and they'll try to scavenge uh, high protein food like meat. Oh boy. All right, Scott, thank you. You're welcome. So, um, and then when I do presentations for say children, uh, you know, a lot of times kids have a fascination. Maybe it, it, maybe it's not just kids because they have Shark Week, like on uh, Discover Channel and things like that. But you know, I'll ask them, well, what's the most deadly animal in the world to humans? And uh, you know, they'll come back with grizzly bears or white great white sharks, something like that. And no, 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 it's uh, f female mosquitoes, especially the ones in the uh, genus Anopheles uh, in uh, Africa and Asia that spread diseases that kill over a million people a year in the world. And that, that's an estimate. It's thought to be an underestimate because uh, many of the victims of these diseases are children under the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa where record keeping is not always the best. But for the most part, insects provide valuable services to us. In the vast majority of insects, uh, it's estimated that only a tenth of a percent are pests. And by pests, we mean things that uh, say uh, could uh, spread disease to us or our livestock or other animals, uh, can attack our structures like carpenter ants or termites, uh, uh, compete with us for our crops or our forage for our livestock, those types of pests. The, uh, only, you know, the other 99.9% uh, uh, of insects are either beneficial or innocuous, or we maybe don't don't really know uh, what their ecological function is. But certainly uh, for gardeners, pollination is a big one because uh, you know, many of our uh, 
uh, plants that provide a lot of flavor and fruits and, and, and vegetables on our table require insect pollination. And you can see here with this uh, uh, bumblebee, she's just covered with pollen. Uh, she's visiting these flowers. And then this bumblebee's flying off with pollen packed on her, her uh, corbicula. And, and just, uh, you can really see how effective they can be. And you often think, well, it's, you know, all we need is bees then. Well, actually, there's a lot of insects that provide pollination services, especially wild pollinators. And of course, in North America, you know, the European honeybee is not native. And so all our native flowering plants that require insect pollination had others to do that for them. So even things like beetles, like this is a, a, a subfamily of longhorn beetle called the longhorn flower beetle, which is aptly named because you often find the adults visiting flowers and the flowers that, uh, are attractive to them are ones that uh, provide sacrificial parts that the beetles will eat. And then they, the beetles have a hairy thorax uh, under here and they will pick up pollen. And then the next flower that they visit, they can pollinate it. And of course, in, uh, in many areas, uh, uh, there are flies that are good pollinators, uh, like these, this pair of Narcissus flies. You can see pollen actually on the female here. So uh, they definitely uh, can do a lot of uh, good for gardens. Uh, they also help with decomposition and recycling of nutrients. So here's a carrion beetle cleaning up on, uh, say, a foot of a rodent helps get get uh, the environment clean and recycles those nutrients. Uh, ants are also very important uh, for not only uh, helping move organic material into the soil profile, but just in soil structure. When you think of the thousands of years that ants would be making tunnels and hauling uh, particles up and, and things down, how that could affect uh, the formation of soils. And of course, uh, classically, uh, you know, things like dung beetles are very important uh, to maintain the health of grazing uh, ecosystems. Now, these are the tumblers. Uh, most of Wyoming species are, are what are called dwellers or, or, or uh, endocroprids. And so they maintain the outer crust of, say, a cow patty and make the balls and either bury them right under the cow patty or uh, will leave them intact in the, in the uh, cow pat. So uh, they are very important for helping maintain the nutrient uh, cycle and the fertility of our grasslands. <clears throat> there are also critical links in the food chain. Uh, in the case here, this is a, a wasp that provisions nest for her larva with a paralyzed spider. And here is a crab spider that nabbed a honeybee that came up to visit that flower. <laughs> and other animals depend on them for food. Many of our songbirds and game birds, uh, the chicks uh, have to have insects as part of their diet in order to fuel that explosive growth. <laughs> and let's see, I see in the chat, I can't hear you. Is that me or is that uh, earlier when Catherine was talking? I hope, hopefully everybody can hear. Is, is there anybody who can't hear? Okay. We can hear you loud and clear over here, Scott. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. And then you can see here a little lizard. He's, I think his eyes are bigger than his stomach. He's got a big old grasshopper going head first down the hatch. <clears throat> so the basis of this introduction is, uh, you know, to try to uh, make people uh, maybe not have such hard feelings about insects. You know, is it hard to love a fly? My mom was not a big fan of insects. Uh, she would often, she would catch something for me and say, oh, I got a really ugly one in the freezer for you. It's got <laughs> and, and she would not have been a fan of this guy. She, she had no uh, love for flies, thinking them all kind of equivalent of house flies. But this is a tachinid fly, and you'd see them visiting flowers. And they're beneficial both as an adult, because they're pollinators, and then they help uh, as uh, their larvae are a form of predator on other insects, such as caterpillars or grasshoppers, because they'll lay an egg, uh, well, in many cases, uh, it can be an egg. In some cases, it'll actually be the larva that goes on to a potential host, and then it bores into uh, the body of the uh, uh, insect, and then we'll eat them from the inside out, non-vital parts first. And then here's the robber fly, just a general insect predator. So both are beneficial <clears throat> if you know more about them. So, you know, can the world survive without insects? 
it wouldn't be the same world without us, without them. And uh, so I, I don't think so. I think, you know, the goal of my talk is, is, you know, some insects are pests and we have to figure out how to manage them, but we have to do it in a way that preserves our uh, ecology and the other insects that are harmless or beneficial <coughs> uh, to us. So any questions? <clears throat> All right. If there's any questions, like say you can uh, uh, either you know get them through to Catherine or put them in the chat if you're uh, on there. Um, you like this? This is a question mark butterfly. You can see the little question mark. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so normally. Normally, I, I in my presentations, you know, I, I go through and give you an introduction, and and then we um, <clears throat> will go through the major orders of horticultural importance, and then I make uh, the students do a hands-on exercise with some specimens that I uh, travel with, and unfortunately, couldn't. Uh, do that tonight so i've got some uh, some variations and uh, uh actually it, it it makes it uh a little bit more work for me and and what i mean by work is i have to talk uh longer and so i'll, I'll plan on giving you a break here probably um uh, there's a uh, pretty natural break in this presentation and and then we can go from there <clears throat> yeah. so out of the insect orders, there are some of, uh, I guess, major importance to horticulture. And that's what I'm going to cover. And these are ones that are either beneficial or uh, they can uh, contain pests or uh, both. And uh, so that's why I cover them. Other orders uh, are, may not even be found in Wyoming or uh, are not uh, considered uh, of any import to horticultural or agricultural. So, so this is uh, about taxonomy, which is just uh, essentially a science of classifying organisms. And, and uh, taxonomists do that and it helps us organize and talk about things. Um, you don't have to become a taxonomist though to make you know, good management identifications. So you don't have to determine, you know, what subspecies this insect is that's, uh, you know, chewing on your uh, tomato uh, to in order to figure out how, the, you know, the best way to deal with it. It's always good to learn as much as you can, but I like say in some cases it, it takes um, uh, an expert in within a taxonomic group to uh, do that. The basic organization of life is of course kingdom phylum class order family genus species and so this uh, grasshopper and i told you you'd see lots of grasshoppers in my presentation <clears throat> it has lots of common names and uh, probably the best one and i think the accepted common name for it by the entomological society of america is snakeweed grasshopper uh, but others like clown grasshopper uh, the uh, rainbow grasshopper those types of things so it is in the kingdom Animalia, just like us. It is in the phylum Arthropoda or Arthropoda. I think it's pronounced both ways, depending on whether it's English or American pronunciation. But you notice that it has an A on the end of it. So it's an, it's an arthropod. It belongs to the phylum Arthropoda. Class Insecta. So uh, insect belongs to that class. Again, uh, that A is actually the name of the class. Insecta is the name of the class and you drop it off. So um, like say, first thing, is it an insect or is it some other arthropod? Order is very important in insects because there's so many different kinds of insects. Uh, the This pretty broad categorization right under class is important. So orthoptera, that means straight wing. You'll see lots of this P-T-E-R-A in the names of uh, orders, and that refers to the wing. So it's a descriptive term. That helps me remember those things uh, if I know a little bit about what that translates to. 
family is acrididae. So all insect families within an order end in I-D-A-E. And then if you're talking, say you just want to talk about the grasshoppers within the order Orthoptera, you'd say acridid. You just drop that off, and, and and so you say, well, yeah, we got a, an accreted jump uh, onto my corn plant today, and that'd be the same as saying a grasshopper did. Genus is Hesperotetix, and the species is Viridus. The genus is like our family name; it's always capitalized, but it comes first, and it's either underlined or italicized. So if you're seeing that. Uh, in you know a, a book or a, a bulletin or something like that, you, you can immediately know that this is a genus. And and uh, the uh, uh, thing about that is that you can have um, you know lots of categories uh, besides these, but these are the most important ones. And then finally, a species or most specific is viridus. Uh, and, and so this is always underlined or italicized and it's always lowercase. So that, that'd be like our first name. So uh, it, it's kind of uh, just reversed, but Hesperotetix viridus. There's actually another species uh, here in the state called Hesperotetix speciosa. And so these, uh, this is actually a beneficial grasshopper in that it specializes on eating weeds uh, like broom snakeweed. So it helps control uh, a weed that is not uh, palatable to our livestock and helps keep it from increasing and taking over rangeland uh, as livestock graze and, and chew on the favorable plants. If there's nothing uh, to, uh, you know, inhibit the uh, unfavorable plants, the increasers, then you could have this uh, occur where it takes over the range. So these are a, a, a benefit to um, uh, ranchers to have on their range. The importance of insect order and family. So many times the family level is actually uh, good enough for management. If you know, you know what the pest is on and, and the family of the pest, because uh, you may not realize it, but things like an aphid, that is actually any of the uh, uh, genus and, and species of aphidae. So uh, a lot of times, say, a, a, uh, you have an organic spray that is labeled for aphids, then if you've determined that your pest is an aphid, then you are, uh, you know, you're good to go as far as following the label, and we always follow the label. Um, the identification reference books are always organized around these classification levels. Now, unfortunately, the, the taxonomists like to change these up. Uh, that's, that's just what they do, and we have to be flexible. For genus and species level ID, sometimes you have to have uh, specialized taxonomic keys or expert assistance. One of the things about the, this is that uh, many of the pests are, we know more about them because they are pests than we do other insects. So uh, in some cases, you can uh, figure it out pretty easily what uh, species you're dealing with. And we've already talked about the diagnostic characters of insects. Sometimes you have to look at them uh, under high magnification. This is a, a, a Sanfoin seed calcid. So this is a type of little wasp that uh, uh, the females will insert their eggs in the developing seed of a Sanfoin plant. And then uh, the little wasp will, <clears throat> will develop and will emerge out of that. But it still has the six legs, three pairs of legs, three body parts, a head, thorax, and abdomen, and the wings. Now, insect wings can vary. Um, say a, an adult flea has no wings because it's the living in the hair of its host, and the wings are just getting its way. So zero, one, or two pairs of wings, and then one pair of antenna. You can see the antenna here. So sometimes it's not always that apparent. So this is an adult aphid. She is apterous or wingless in form. And you have to look at her with some magnification to kind of see the segmentation of her body. But here's her head. And here are the segments of her thorax where her legs originate. And, and so again, this is all just uh, becoming, you know, as you become more experienced and look at more uh, insects, then you can pick up on these things. 
other important parts that are used as diagnostic characters and are very important for gardeners to know because these are how insects can inflict damage and the type of damage on plants are mouth parts, antennae, and the tarsi or feet and the wings number and form. So again, the mouth parts are very important. You have uh, creatures that have uh, say mandibles. Sometimes it uh, may not be very apparent. This is a structure, it's a, a kind of an insect lip that covers up the small mandibles and they move side to side, uh, not up and down like ours. And some of the insects, they have them out and they're very apparent. So like this uh, uh, ground beetle, uh, which is a predator, of other insects has them out where it can grab prey with those strong mandibles. Uh, of course, other insects that feed on plant material will have mandibles too. Piercing sucking beaks, now there's lots of variation on that. They can be uh, for feeding on plants or in some cases they're predators of other insects uh, or in some cases they're uh, predators or parasites of us and they'll feed on the blood of uh, other animals. And then you know, have uh, variations on that are the flexible, uh, uh, no, not, not piercing, but sucking and flexible and they coil it up when not in use. And so the coiled proboscis on uh, butterflies and moths. And then another variation are sponging. So uh, they regurgitate liquid onto uh, food, digestive <laughs> liquid. <laughs> yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Somebody's uh, not muted. Uh, and then they uh, can re uh, they suck that back up. And so you can see why flies, especially the ones that we call filth flies, can be a, a very effective uh, uh, mechanical transmitters of disease organisms because of the way they feed. Antennae. Uh, the, some of the things like a house fly doesn't have very uh, apparent antennae and many of the flies they utilize vision more than the sense of smell, but they'll have a wrist ate. So they have a bristle on a couple of little knobs uh, and that's all the antennae they have. Others are thread-like or filiform like grasshoppers, clubbed. Uh, now there are some um, beetles and a few grasshoppers that are more kind of a flattened club, not a, a big club, but all butterflies have clubbed antenna. That's an easy way to tell, is that a butterfly or a moth? And then of course, plumos. Uh, and there are beetles that have plumos antennae. Uh, some of the sawflies have uh, the, and the, most of these are insects that rely on a sense of smell. And that's where insects generally have their uh, organisms for uh, detecting odors is on their antennae. The tarsi or feet, is they can sometimes give you a clue about the insect, where it lives and what it does. In this case, here is a, a predaceous diving beetle, and it has its hind tarsi modified for swimming because it spends most of its life swimming in ponds. It does have the ability to fly as an adult, and you'll sometimes find them in unusual places like um, in the summertime uh, on a, a wet asphalt parking lot. So you've had a rain and the, the parking lights are shining down and it looks like the surface of a pond or a lake. And that's generally when they go out flying around looking for a new habitat. And then they can crash land on, on those surfaces. Um, other insects, sometimes you, you'll need to uh, count the number of segments on these tarsi. So insect legs are, are uh, named like kind of like our bones so they have a femur and then a tibia and then these are tarsal segments and so you have here's one two three four five and then these two are sixes and so this would be a six six five pattern of tarsi uh, two segments here five segments there so sometimes they, you are asked about uh, you know how many tar tarsi you have especially when you get down to the point if you're trying to identify species <clears throat> Uh, now, I talked a little bit about how the variation in form between the uh, adult and immature uh, can be uh, drastically different. So here is the uh, aquatic uh, immature dragonfly. Looks very different and acts very different uh, and has different capabilities than the adult. So we'll cover a little bit. This is not one that we consider horticulturally important, but it was a nice example of how the variation between the immature and adult farm is. 
insects will generally go through two major types. There's actually a couple other ones that are for minor uh, orders uh, like uh, fire brats and silverfish. They kind of have a, 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 an indeterminate number of molts and they look pretty much the same. They never get wings and they, they just get bigger. Uh, whereas the insects that go through simple or incomplete metamorphosis, they hatch out of the ground and they look kind of like a miniature adult that lack wings and are sexually immature. And then they have to molt in order to grow between each stage. And they usually do that hanging upside down on vegetation. They'll split that old exoskeleton that's too small for them now and crawl out and expand their new soft exoskeleton and reharden it. Now, when you consider how many thousands of grasshoppers can be on an acre of land in the summertime, uh, maybe coming in and chewing on your vegetable garden, I often ask students in the classes that I teach, how many people have ever found a grasshopper molting, knowing that each one of those adult grasshoppers you see in late summer has done this at least five times. So it's kind of interesting. They, they, they're very vulnerable at this stage and they don't want to be seen. So it is interesting. Uh, and it has value too, because uh, uh, actually one of the best uh, products that we have, all it does is interfere with this molt. And so it, it utilizes a, 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 a a product that uh, doesn't have any impact on um, uh, creatures that don't go through a molting process, very specific to insectas. So again, it goes through and then we'll reach adulthood. If an insect has wings that have cross veins on it, that it has completed its development and won't get any bigger and won't molt anymore. Another example and what uh, a lot of our pest uh, insects and beneficial insects go through is complete metamorphosis. So they ha start out as an egg, then they hatch out and the larva uh, is very different from what the adult form will be. Uh, in this case, here's a, uh, a, a monarch butterfly and these will be the adult legs when it uh, matures. So here's the head in where the chewing mouth parts are. These are on the abdominal segments and these are called abdominal prolegs. And this is important because you, there's another type of insect uh, I'll talk about uh, that is a little different and would be uh, not vulnerable to some of the controls that are very specific to butterflies and moths. So here is uh, the larva and then they go through a complete metamorphosis in a pupa. In the case of a butterfly, it's called a chrysalis and make the big change into the adult form and repeat that process. So what are some of the other larva forms? So this is the emerald ash borer, a terrible invasive pest that's <clears throat> killing lots of ash trees back east. It's vermiform, no, no legs, a worm-like grub living under the bark. Uh, of, uh, so it doesn't need to have legs. It's just chewing its way in the uh, cambium layer of a uh, ash tree. This is a uh, vermiform with no head capsule, just hooks. And so uh, these are not two eyeballs. This is uh, <clears throat> the air uh, uh, system that allows air into the body of the insect because they, generally the head in is emerged, submerged into food, it's liquefying. And then it has some hooks and it has little projections on the body. So it can kind of squirm around, uh, but this is what a housefly maggot looks like. And then this is of course the drastically different adult form. Vermiform with a head capsule, no legs, and a good example of that are fungus gnats. So they do have chewing mouth parts that can chew on the hyphae of fungi that's in, uh, uh, say, a, a pot of, of, of uh, soil that, that's maybe got a little bit too much water and organic matter and is, is growing fungus. And so that is an example that they have. No legs, they just kind of chew their way through the medium. Compodia forms, legs well developed and mobile. And don't worry about these the these names as far as memorizing them or anything like that. I'm just giving you examples. I what I really want you to to be aware of is the variety and forms and shapes and things like that. Because I often have people they'll they'll send me uh, uh, these lady beetle larvae 
not knowing, you know, everybody knows the lady beetle or ladybugs are actually a beetle. I do prefer that name for them. Uh, but they don't realize these little uh, colorful alligator type critters are are the larva form of the and and so they're um, in some cases uh, they will do treatments because uh, uh, it's in in the one case they had a willow tree that had lots of aphids in it and of course it had uh, lady beetle larva feeding on them and occasionally they'd fall out and they will bite you they'll taste test you uh, they're not you know harm harmful they don't have any venom or anything like that and they so they sprayed it and then sent some in what are these things and uh, so again it, it's good to know these uh, various forms Scaraboform that goes back to the Scarabidae, the scarab beetle family, and here's the tin line June beetle. And then this, I don't know why that color came out like this, but it, it, nonetheless, this is the typical form of a scarab beetle. That when you dig them out, they kind of curl up into a C. And generally, uh, you have to look at things like these spherical plates and the number of and pattern of spines on the hind end of them to identify them in larval form. A lateral form is what the click beetles look like. So this is a click beetle. If you've ever played with a click beetle, you put them on their back and they struggle for a little bit and then they can pop that uh, a, a peg on the front of their thorax and they'll, they'll flip up in the air. And if they're lucky, they land on their feet. If not, they have to uh, do that two or three times until they do so. So a lateral day are the click beetles and then the form like this where it's kind of round and cylindrical and have very reduced legs and they uh, many of these will chew into the roots of plants that's their habitat and so in this case this is a sugar beet wireworm larva again caterpillars like i said the abdominal prolegs uh, are a diagnostic character for them and then what's on their prolegs is really diagnostic so uh, the caterpillars will have their legs that will become their legs as adults and then five or fewer of these abdominal prolix and they have these little crochets on there so you'd have to look with some magnification but that's how you would identify them whereas the next one the saw flies in a different order they have six or more pairs of prolix and no crochets so there are uh, uh, say uh, uh, bt products bacillus thuringiensis products that are suitable for the order lepidopter which are butterflies and moths and in case you're wondering why i'm talking about controlling butterflies in the case of the uh, black swallowtail uh, they can be a major pest in uh, carrots and parsley crops their caterpillars that's the their the the preferred host plant uh, types for the black swallowtails. Uh, whereas if it turned out to be uh, sawfly, that uh, BT product would be totally ineffective. In this case, this is a, they're called sawflies because the females will have a saw like ovipositor and she's inserting an egg into a, uh, the, in this case, a pine needle. And this is the pine sawfly. They usually the larva come out and they feed together, occasionally up on, uh, uh, Camp Guernsey is where I've seen or heard about it the most in those uh, uh, pine trees up there. They can have outbreaks. Generally, they eat the older needles and leave the younger needles behind. And so it's not as damaging. If, if it's the reverse, it'd be very damaging for a pine tree. But if they're eating the older needles, then uh, you know it, the tree still can produce food for itself. So any questions so far? All right. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll take uh, uh, a little, uh, let's uh, come back at seven o'clock. You can get up and stretch. I need to get a little drink of water. And uh, if there's any questions, you can put them in the chat or save them up. And, and before we start up with the next portion of the presentation, uh, I'll try to answer. Okay, Scott, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So again, help yourselves to coffee, tea, Unhealthy snacks. <laughs> Insects?
So are you in town or out in the county? Okay. Um, do you have animals on your property or are there animals near you? Okay. So if there's cattle not too far away, it wouldn't surprise me if they're kind of bringing them in. And, and that's where your flies are originating from is the cattle. What to do about them? Uh, I usually put out those little sticky fly tapes and and I'll put fly traps, the ones, the disposable ones where they fly into it and then they can't get out. They find the door in, but they can't find the door out. <laughs> so are there pigs from there? Probably, yeah, the cow pies. Is there any beef cows that are close to the Those are fungus gnats. Or is it in my soup? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which one for here? Do that now. So when it comes back, you're welcome to ask the question or yeah. Or I can I can put it in chat for him and he can answer it. Oh yeah, I'm just curious about these crabs starting last year. My chicken was also. I was just curious on the location. The big Oh that's thing. that's um the grub that Scott was just talking about, that scab of one. Yeah. I'm wondering because like that looks a lot of money. Boy, you have happy chickens. They were happy. I was not. I said, yeah, I'm going to touch them. <laughs> yeah, that's where you pick them up and toss them. Oh, yeah. Or, or if you don't want to touch them, you get a spoon and you plant them to the chickens. Yeah, I'll do that with my spade and I'm putting them over there. Okay, so what's your question? Oh, to actually. The uh, black tail uh, uh, butterfly, the larva form, is green and white. And I didn't know what it was, so I squished it and it looked like it had green buds. Does anything have green buds? There were a few times that I think it was just a pale fly. Stung my cat. That's fine. But if it turns into a butterfly, it's just move it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, black tail swallow, swallow tail. Yeah. Our room is excellent squash, and it green squish is its normal. Yeah. And it looked like it was green blood. I don't know if anything that was green blood. And uh, you had another question. The other one was the um, like. Friend up in Montana grows wheat and they get decimated by grasshoppers. Is there anything besides that? I mean, they get, they get, you can see it on the like radar. Yeah. The fields that it's so we'll talk a little bit about that in um, the pesticide class because there is, um, there is a um, Bassiana, not thinking in that terms, but there is a, um, a protozoa you could spread that comes on, on a barley that they'll eat and kills them. And I found that the hands down most effective method of getting rid of grasshoppers, chickens. Chickens. I've been able to eradicate the infestation of grasshoppers with my chickens 24 hours. But we'll talk about in, in the pesticide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, as soon as I get everyone's name inputted into the system, then we'll have a session. Okay, that's fine.
It's an avalanche. Yep. Good. 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 Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm supposed to raise ominous grass, and it's most likely um, downy brome. Smooth brome. It's most likely smooth brome. And it's very evasive, loves water, hard to eradicate. Best way to kill it is not to water. Yeah. Hard to do this in your garden. Otherwise, you have to just dig it up and shake the roots off and throw it away. Yep. 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 Let it decay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you. 
Have I been muted this whole time? I, I can't hear anybody on your end. I, I don't know if I'm coming through or not. Okay. Does. All right, to briefly go back and uh, uh, will we receive the PowerPoint? Uh, Catherine's recording and uh, I generally don't provide the PowerPoint. You you can review it and look at the uh, recording again if, if you want to see it. Um, the green squish inside of an insect uh, like a, a larva of a swallowtail would be mainly from the food matter it was eating and you know the digestion of that. Uh, insect blood, for the most part, doesn't have um, hemoglobin, which provides the red color and transports oxygen for us. They have a passive uh, way of getting oxygen into their body through the sphericals, and, and so they don't need to have a transport system like we do. Um, and, and the only one exception of that would be the bloodworms of the family Chironomidae that live in really oxygen poor environments, and then they'll move up in the water column to where there's oxygen and charge a form of, it's not like our hemoglobin, it's different, but that's why they're bright red. And then they can move back and feed in that oxygen poor environment. Um, let's see. And then, um, uh, Catherine, uh, do you know, were those assassin bugs or ambush bugs or uh, uh, assassin bugs are reduviidae and they're generalist predators uh, of other insects. Ambush bugs are even better at hiding into vegetation, especially on flowers and grabbing insects that come to visit the flowers. Uh, and it just, it's one of those things, you know, they're uh, just a generalist predator. So, okay. With that, <clears throat> uh, the principal insect orders of horticultural importance, we'll go through them in a little bit more detail. Again, 
Uh, the order names are translated from classical Greek for the most part, uh, sometimes Latin. Uh, if, and uh, you'll see this P-T-E-R-A a lot, and that means wing. So it's kind of, most of these are descriptive terms. So the order orthoptera means straight wing, but uh, insects are full of exceptions. So here's an angle wing Katie did, So, but it belongs to the orthoptera. Uh, major character of this order are enlarged hind legs for jumping. You can see that here. <laughs> Uh, includes the shorthorn ones uh, like grasshoppers uh, that uh, can be a pest uh, and then others like the pygmy grasshopper which is never a pest uh, certainly uh, then we have things like this is the plains lubber grasshopper and at this latitude it's not generally a pest it eats broadleaf plants they like scurf pea uh, they like sunflowers and roadsides those types of things. In, in Mexico, uh, they can be a major pest in some of the crops they grow there. Uh, the order Orthoptera also includes the longhorn members. And longhorn just refers to long and penny, although not necessarily everybody. Uh, so mole crickets, and I've never found a mole cricket in Wyoming. Of course, I, I don't sample a lot with a shovel and that's what you'd have to do because they live up to their common name in that they are subterranean and they dig with these front legs and they're, they don't do much jumping. Uh, Katie Dids, this is a Mormon cricket. That's the common name, but it's a poor common name because they're not Mormons and they're not crickets. They are flightless Katie Did. This is a female. She has a sword-like ovipositor that she can use to stick into the soil to place her eggs. And then, of course, the Jerusalem cricket, and that is the accepted common name for these creatures. Uh, they have uh, uh, just a whole bunch of other common names like potato bug and child of the earth and, and sand puppy, all sorts of things. Uh, again, uh, <clears throat> Orthoptera used to include the mantids. Now, I'm, I, if I do this in person, I generally have a bunch of these Peterson's guides to insects, and they're great old reference, but they're kind of old, but they included in the front and back end covers uh, diagnostic key to the orders. So that's, uh, I generally would let people know what has changed in taxonomy since the publication of that book a long time ago. So the mantids have now been moved to their own order, Mantodia, and probably the most numerous one that we have in Wyoming now is the European mantid. And uh, they can either be tan or green. The really good diagnostic characters of them uh, after they get bigger is they'll uh, flare out their front legs and they have a, a black and white bullseye in their armpits. Hmm. The order Orthoptera used to include uh, walking sticks. And we probably have more walking sticks than we are aware of because they have exceptional camouflage and they're usually uh, in the canopy of uh, trees or deep into you know, shrubbery. Uh, you can pick them up sometimes. Uh, sometimes for unknown reasons, they'll also gather say like on the sides of buildings, uh, maybe for mating. Uh, I, uh, there's a, a place in Laramie that has that happen occasionally. Um, and so uh, like say they do eat leaves, but not in any meaningful amount to be considered a pest. The order Dermaptera, so the entire order is given a common name called earwigs. And Dermaptera roughly translates to skin wing, you know, dermis like epidermis, all those types of things that refer to skin. So the European earwig is our most common and most pestiferous. Uh, they uh, are, are interesting creatures. Uh, uh, the, them and some of the other species can actually fly. They will have wings that can fold up like ear gummy underneath those. And then this is the male, this is the female. You can tell by the shape and size of the pincers. The females of most insects are bigger than the males because they all produce eggs. Uh, and, and so they need to be bigger. Um, this is also, uh, it, kind of a cautionary tale for people about how many insects we have brought to this country either on purpose or accidentally. So 12 of the 20 species in the U.S. were introduced from elsewhere. And uh, it's thought the European earwig was first introduced to the Seattle area in 1907, but 
who knows? They are interesting in that they provide parental care. Uh, they are one of the few insects that uh, uh, where they, you know, will try to protect their eggs and, and even after they've hatched for a while, try to provide some protection. Thysanoptera, fringe wing, thrips. These are important pests and they're often overlooked pests because they're so small. Most of the species are between one and 1.5 millimeters long. Now, not all thrips are bad and not all thrips that are pests uh, are always pestiferous. Uh, they, it kind of depends. Uh, uh, generally, the beneficial thrips are boldly marked with uh, black and white. And they're beneficial because they will feed on the eggs of things like, uh, say, two-spotted spider mite and help control their populations. Uh, other thrips, they feed by disrupting the surface of the plant leaf and then sucking up that fluid. And, and so uh, in some cases, they can transmit diseases. Uh, others, like western flower thrips, is um, probably one of the most important pests of uh, dry beans that we have in Wyoming, and I think probably regionally, uh, because they will get into the flowers of the uh, bean and their feeding will inhibit the set of seeds. So they will reduce the number of seeds in the pot. And, and that impacts the yields, uh, can impact it drastically. It can be very tough to uh, control. Uh, they have two stages where uh, they are uh, either non-feeding or off the plant and their eggs are actually inserted into, uh, for most species, into the plant tissue. So they're also protected in that fashion too. An interesting aside to, to talk about how small some insects are and probably how overlooked many of these things can be is this is a parasitoid, an egg parasitoid that attacks thrips eggs. So thrips are really small. And then this is a little wasp that inserts her egg into the egg of a thrip. And then that will develop completely within that one egg. And so this is two scale, uh, an adult of this species called Megaphragma mamaropeni, and a paramecium and amoeba. They, in some cases, you can uh, get uh, these egg parasitoids of different species. They're generally in the family Trichogrammatidae, and uh, many of them have been placed into the genus Trichogramma. And here's an example of. Uh, Here's a dime. Here's the egg of a manduka species moth. So manduka could be either a tomato or a tobacco hornworm. In our area, it'd probably be a tomato hornworm. From that single egg, the 28 little wasps emerge. So in some cases, uh, it, you know, where it took one thrips to get one wasp here. One of these big eggs could produce 28 of these little egg parasitoids. The order Hemiptera includes the true bugs. It's been enlarged considerably by the taxonomists, but uh, for the most part, uh, I, I still treat them as Hemiptera, uh, uh, just based on that means half wing. And what that half wing refers to is a, a two textured front wing on the species that get wings. So the you know, box elder bug is a good example of that. It has a membranous hind part on and a thickened leathery part. So it's like, it's all one wing, but it's two textures. You can see here, it goes through incomplete metamorphosis. So here's a little guy. And then as they get bigger, their wing buds get bigger until the next molt on this particular one, it'll be an adult. And you can see here bed bugs, they never get wings. You can see where the vesticle wings were, uh, but they don't need wings. They get around by riding on their hosts. Um, there's also uh, bat bugs and swallow bugs, very similar to these. They think that's the uh, ancestors of these were uh, insects that fed on uh, colonial uh, animals like bats and where uh, the nests of swallows because they often nest in colonies. Uh, there's also one that uh, feeds um, on swifts and I forget there's a couple others but uh, they all generally have this flattened body form without wings. And then you have some of them that are really small, but very uh, important 
predators, beneficial. Minute pirate bugs are very important predators in your garden that would be overlooked. They would be ones taken on the uh, spider mites or the thrips, those types of things. Has a piercing sucking beak. And if they bite you, I guess they, I've never been bit by one, but I heard it hurts. Hemiptera have a piercing sucking mouth part. Uh, it's, there's always exceptions, but the vast majority of the ones that feed on plants, the very first segment that originates off the front of their head is attached to their, what passes for their face or their head, and then is hinged. So then they carry it in between their front legs in a groove. The predators, uh, either blood feeders or predators of other insects, their uh, beak is hinged at the front of their head so they can grab prey and then they suck the juices out of them. The order Homoptera means hey, Scott? same. One. Yes. Scott, I got a, a quick question here in chat. Um, on assassin bugs and their methods of any kind we could use to remove the predators, to reduce the loss of our honey and native bum bumblebees and native bees. Yeah, it's um, generally um, you don't have. Uh, a lot of predators. I mean, essentially, I guess you could probably go in there and and hand remove them, but uh, I wouldn't consider uh, you know any kind of treatment that you would do would also impact potentially your beneficial insects. So perhaps um, you know, like I said, uh, uh, if they were bad uh, in, in a particular spot, do some hand removal, but it would be very tough to, to do that. Like say, usually predators are not that abundant. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah, I, I guess I've never uh, encountered a situation where, you know, a lot of times I like to look at say a patch of sunflowers when it's in bloom and look at all the different insects coming there. And you will see things like crab spiders or ambush bugs and stuff like that, but they aren't on every flower and it's, uh, s certainly, um, you know, being a pollinating insect is a hazardous activity because there are predators out there, but I, I don't think that that is a, uh, there's a practical way of doing control. Uh, order Homoptera, same wing. Uh, they've now been moved into a suborder on, uh, or actually separated and moved into suborders in Hemiptera. So almost all the older literature had them as uh, their own order. And uh, I think it's pretty valid, but I don't make those decisions. So that means their front and hind wings were similar in size and shape. They have a piercing sucking beak, but it uh, attaches to the body where the head attaches to the thorax. So here's the front legs, and then it folds down into this groove here. But instead of being on the front, like a hemiptera, and it's back here. Those are eyeballs looking at you there. So you can see here, uh, uh, there are lots of them, and many of them are small, uh, and they can hop pretty well. Uh, some of the species will be called leaf hoppers, uh, frog hoppers, those types of things. So uh, this homoptera included the aphids, which are, you know, uh, big time plant pests. You can see here, here's uh, the beak of a little wingless or apterous aphid uh, being inserted into the plant tissue to feed on phloem. And so they feed on the sap of the plant and that's where they produce honeydew because uh, you know the, it's mainly water with some of the carbohydrates in it. And so to get all the nutrients they need, they have to process a lot of that and they'll produce a lot of that as excess and just uh, put it on the plant uh, and that will attract other insects, uh, certainly ants and ants will tend and protect them too and then feed directly on the droplets of honeydew that they produce. <clears throat> the order Homoptera includes the cicadas. Now we don't have the, the long-term periodical cicadas like the 17 and 13 year locust here, but we do have other species that uh, can take anywhere from uh, two to four years to uh, complete their life cycle and then come out as adults. And uh, for the most part, it, you know, when you think about uh, the, the years when they have a big brood of say like the 17 year locusts emerge, 
the uh, the amount of biomass feeding on the trees because it, in that that period it took them to develop they're feeding every year they're feeding on uh, the the roots of the trees with the piercing sucking mouth part so again uh, we do have some interesting ones they make calls there's a, a cicada central is uh, I think the name of it uh, or cicada mania I think it could be where they have all the calls and and that can be easier way to identify them is by their their the buzzing that they make homoptera included the white flies generally a more of a pest of say uh, hoop houses or greenhouses in our climate but uh, they are small and they also feed with piercing sucking mouth part and produce honeydew uh, they can be a difficult pest to deal with uh, sometimes in the hoop house or a, a greenhouse if you can modify environment uh, and, and make it difficult for them to live uh, then that can help but it can be a difficult pest the homoptera includes the scale insects, and they are ones that really only look like an insect. The very first stage that ha hatches out of the egg, or occasionally uh, the males uh, on certain species, they'll produce males that can fly and will have the diagnostic characters of an insect. The females, for the most part, usually crawl away from where they hatched, and they will find a place on the plant and insert their mouth parts and then molt and lose their diagnostic characters. And in the case of the soft scales, they feed on phloem and they're often uh, protected by ants because they'll get uh, honeydew in exchange. And what they're protecting them from are other insects that would prey on them. So uh, things, you know, certainly like a minute pirate bug would uh, uh, take on one of these things, no problem. Uh, but again, the hard scales are a little bit different. They feed on parenchymal tissue. Where they insert their mouth in there and they produce a waxy uh, hard covering. So they're not soft and squishy like the soft scales. They're uh, often waxy. Uh, probably our most abundant one we get is the uh, oyster shell scale that appears on many uh, plants. Uh, they usually uh, do more harm on things like aspen or cotoneaster. Uh, uh, again, uh, just feeding on the uh, tissue of the plant. And of course, if you were uh, trying to produce apples for sale, uh, you aren't gonna probably get too much for this apple that has San Jose scale on it. Homoptera includes the mealybugs, really the only major pest that we have here in Wyoming. Uh, it, it's an inconsistent pest, but it, it can be a pest in uh, barley production called the Hanshin barley mealybug. Mm -hmm. The order Coleoptera are the beetles, which means sheath wing. It's thought that Aristotle was the one that coined this name, and it refers to uh, the beetles uh, the, as adults having the front wing modified into a shield that covers their body and hides that uh, the functional flight wing. Now, not all uh, beetles can fly. In some cases, say like black vine weevil or the lilac root weevil, they, uh, it's fused and they, they've lost that ability to fly. There is a large family of beetles called the rove beetles or staphylinidae, and they have very short elytra and exposed abdomen, and they'll have functional wings tucked up under there. So the main characters of the beetles, the largest insect order, are chewing mandibles, both as adults and as larvae. And they have this straight line down their back. That, that's where the two uh, front wings meet. Now, you've, uh, when I pointed out, like on the hemiptera, they overlap uh, each other. They don't meet in a straight line. They overlap in this case. So uh, anyway, that's... Uh, Here's a true bug, uh, a hemipteran. This is actually a shield bug. And so it, at first glance, if you couldn't see the mouth part, you might think, well, that looks like a beetle, but it lacks the line down its back. Where And here is a little uh, weevil. And it has, uh, it'd be very hard to distinguish it. You probably have to look at it with magnification, but it is fused. There's a straight line down its back where the two wings were fused when it molted. And here's one of those little rove beetles. 
and very, very uh, diverse. If one of the largest families within the Coleoptera, um, often found uh, like around compost piles or uh, they'll, uh, the, many of our species will uh, visit manure uh, and will prey on the uh, fly larva that also uh, utilize manure for uh, egg production. So it, if we uh, had the specimen, you could look at it under magnification, it'd probably be easier to see, but when uh, knowing that this is a beetle, and there is a straight line down its back. This is not a beak. It doesn't have a hinge uh, at any point on it. It's actually an elongated face. Those uh, are the antenna, the base of the antenna are actually out here on the sides of its elongated face and it has chewing mandibles. So the, the, there are broad nose weevils and then there are ones like this European chestnut weevil that have a really elongated snout chewing mandibles and so they could chew into nuts and then uh, many times the females will insert their eggs into those holes too. So, uh, Order Lepidoptera, butterflies and moss and that refers to scale wing and the uh, uh, it's kind of like a mosaic pattern on their wings that give this color and pattern. And if you've ever handled, say you've got, grabbed a Miller moth to throw it outside or something like that, and you, there's that dust. And that's part of the reason why they're called Miller moths is the Millers were uh, the people that uh, milled the grain in the flour. And so they'd come home every day all covered with dust. And if you've ever done that, if you actually look at those, those are little tiny scales to give the color and pattern on the wings of a Miller moth that came off in your hands. So again, uh, you can, as you zoom in with magnification, you can see these scales. And so this is, this is a diagnostic character. No other insects have that. Now there are some of them that have, uh, they have limited amounts of scales and they'll have clear wings like glass wing butterfly. But uh, the, for the most part, this is a diagnostic character of them uh, along with a proboscis. Although some of them, their lives as adults are so short they don't have functional mouth parts. So this is a scanning electron micrograph showing the membranous wing and then the flattened scales. And then these, I, I don't, I don't, I've never read what the function of those would be, whether they just help hold the scales down in flight, I'm not sure. The order Neuroptera, lace wings or nerve wing. And so that refers to this fine venation in their wings. And they are uh, excellent predators. When people ask me about what kind of uh, creature they should get for their garden to help you know, control pests. And uh, I'm not a, you know, I don't have anything against lady beetles, but I don't think they're very effective in that they're pretty much aphid specialists. And if you don't have a, a roaring aphid uh, infestation, the uh, adult beetles won't have a lot of interest in sticking around. Whereas these will hatch out and they'll start feeding on anything and everything that they can catch. And these are the eggs. And you can get these from uh, like garden supply catalogs like Arbico Organic in egg form. And so hatch out and they'll start attacking, say, thrips or spider mites and stuff like that. They're thought to put these on stalks. So the first one out doesn't eat its brothers and sisters. This is what they look like as the immature form, kind of an alligator with two big fangs. So uh, interesting critter. Diptera, true flies, two wings. A modified and reduced hind wings are called halteres. So here's the front wings. And then these structures here that's really apparent on this crane fly are called halteres and that's diagnostic. There's actually, um, I, I think I mentioned it already, I was talking about the sheep kid, which is an ectoparasite of uh, sheep, and I think angora goats, other types of, of uh, critters like that, where um, they live uh, the most of their life on the animals and they don't have functional wings, but they still maintain their halteres, and, and that's a, a diagnostic character for them. There are other members of that uh, particular parasite family uh, called deer kids that have wings. They'll fly around and find, um, uh, the females will find a suitable host like a, a deer or an elk 
and they'll crawl into the hair coat and then pop off their front wings because they don't need them anymore. They found what they needed. Hmm. So the diptera are, are the true flies. The, the surfids are ones, flower flies that visit flowers a lot and often mimic uh, wasps. Uh, that provides them a little protection. They're harmless, but they uh, ha often have this bright warning coloration. Uh, and they are beneficial as adults and also as larvae. For the most part, there are a few species where the larvae are, feed on plant material, but most of them are a predator of soft-bodied insects like aphids. And they have a, uh, a vermiform headless larva. So they crawl around on the plant. They don't really have legs, they have these kind of spiky projections on their abdomen, and they can crawl around and then find the, uh, uh, say, aphids or some other slow moving plant feeding pest, and they can grab them with their mouth hooks and then suck the juices out of them. So they're, they're very beneficial insect. Uh, blowflies, a lot of times we don't think much of blowflies, we consider them maybe a pest as a filth fly, but the adults are very effective pollinators and will feed on many flowers. Uh, some of the flowers that uh, uh, really like to utilize them for pollination duties will be the stinky flowers that smell like uh, something is dead or rotten and they'll attract them in. And of course we have mosquitoes and robber flies also. So uh, two flies are a very important order. Hymenopter, membrane wing, bees, wasps, ants, and sawflies. So uh, a huge order in itself, a very important one. So mm, the vast majority of hymenoptera are what we call non-stinging wasps, although these aphids would disagree with that because what, what she's doing there is inserting an egg into this aphid. That larva will grow and eat the non-vital parts first and, and get to the point where it's fully developed and then the aphid will be dead and they'll puff out the body and spin a little silk cocoon inside the body of that aphid called a mummy. And then we'll cut an escape hatch when it's ready to emerge to repeat the process. So they can be uh, an effective control. If you have aphids, well, number one, you can't really have biological control with zero tolerance for pests. If you have, uh, you know, you need to have some pests to sustain your biological control. And then if you are examining your garden, scouting your garden like you should be, and you do see aphids, take a good close look at them. Do you have uh, mummies uh, appearing? And, and sometimes you have to look very closely. You'll see some, uh, they may not be this white color, but they'll be all puffed out and they'll be immobile and they're in the last stages of uh, being consumed. Uh, this is also, Hymenopter includes the wasps. Now, we, um, Wyoming was the last state, well, I don't think Alaska's got them, but the last continental uh, or lower 48 state to get the European paper wasp. I think it was back in 2009. So this is an introduced invasive species, uh, has golden antenna, which distinguishes it from other paper wasps. It makes an open celled nest. It doesn't cover it like say an aerial yellow jacket nest does. And they are highly effective predators of leaf feeding caterpillars. So much so that uh, Professor Cranshaw down at CSU, he kind of gave up on his butterfly gardening projects in towns because they were like mm -hmm. vacuum cleaners on the uh, caterpillars because they were trying to grow not only flowers for the adults of caterpillars of, of the you know, butterflies, but also have uh, suitable uh, uh, vegetation there for the caterpillars to mature on. I'm an optor, the ants. Uh, again, uh, ants are important and ubiquitous uh, uh, members of the environment. Uh, they have a lot of very interesting behaviors. In this case, these are little aphids uh, and ants will often treat them like livestock. The uh, corn root aphid and the uh, corn field ant are so closely tied, uh, you know, they've adapted to the, the uh, 
uh, production of corn that they will actually move the aphids out of the fields to where their nests are at the edges. And then after the corn has reached a certain height, they will move them back into the uh, fields to feed on the roots of the corn plants. So again, a very interesting behaviors. Uh, two major uh, families of ants, the uh, well, one family and two major subfamilies. So Formicidae, which refers to uh, the ants having the ability to utilize formic acid, uh, but actually there is uh, the Formicinini are the ones that have one hump and their defense is to spray formic acid. The Myrmicinini have two humps and they can sting, they'll bite and then sting usually multiple times in a semicircle. So luckily we don't have the uh, imported uh, fire ants, either the red or black species here in Wyoming, uh, but we do have some other ants that can sting and, and will bite. Uh, and then of course, like say the ones that can spray formic acid, I've never really had a reaction, but if you were got your face close to it or you had a, 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 a lesion on your skin and got the formic acid in it, it wouldn't be pleasant. Hymenoptera, most of them have a wasp waist, that junction between the thorax and the abdomen. Not all of them do, but you can see here on these ants they do, and then this wasp here. They have four wings, often looks like only two, but you can see here, there's a base and there's a base and there's a base and there's a base. And then if we put on the outline of the wings, you can see here, and they hook those hind wings to the front wings with these little tiny hooks called hamulae. So that's a diagnostic character. So number one, if you get uh, something in a, and it might look like, you know, like say flower flies often kind of mimic them, but they only have two functional wings, whereas a wasp would have four wings and you could separate them out and you could say, oh yeah, that's, that's a wasp. Hymenoptera includes sawflies. They're the oldest member of the order. They don't have the wasp waist. They uh, have a, a broad junction and uh, that's because a lot of them are plant feeders. And so they'll need that ability to uh, pass uh, food through them. Many of the ones that are narrow waisted are liquid feeders. Now you may not think of say an ant as being a liquid feeder because you'll see them hauling off solid food, but ants utilize their larva as kind of the um, uh, mouth and stomach of the colony. They'll feed the, the, as they tend their larvae, they'll feed them chunks of stuff that they brought in, whether it's seeds or, or pieces of insect or whatever. And then the larva regurgitate, and that's called trophallaxis. And that's, that liquid food is then fed throughout the colony. All the workers, you know, some of the uh, like soldier ants, uh, they might not even be able to feed themselves. They have to be fed by uh, worker ants. And, and so it, that's, uh, how uh, like uh, uh, ant baits work is that they get taken back to the nest, then they'll feed to the larvae, then the larvae regurgitate that and then it spreads through the colony. And hopefully if you get it to the queen, you've ended that colony if it's a problem. So any type of pest management, whether it's organic or synthetic or, or you know, whether you're just out there with a bucket of soapy water and knocking, uh, pests into it, it requires really the ID of the plant and the pest, if it is one. So in the case, say if you're out there and you have a squash plant and you see these two guys out there, well, the squash bug is a pest. And whereas if you take the time to look and identify, you could see the differences between the predatory and the pest. So what is a great tool for gardeners to have for identifying insects. <clears throat> I think uh, these books by Whitney Cranshaw are, are excellent. They are uh, amazing pieces of work because they have such great uh, photography. They often show the eggs, they have the larva, they show the plant feeding damage, they show the adults. And the first edition, uh, Garden Insects in North America is pretty, 
uh, modestly titled because it contains a lot of insects that feed on more than just garden insect, uh, garden plants. The second edition is a great book. It included even more tree and turf feeding insects. Uh, Whitney partnered with uh, Professor David Shetler at Ohio State University. Uh, but they ran out of time on this and didn't include the appendix that they have in the first one of the plant pest index. So if anybody decides to buy this, uh, I think Catherine probably already has it. I have it available. Uh, Whitney provided me with uh, the plant pest index in PDF form that goes with this. So it, it, like I say, uh, this is a great book because it can utilize your knowledge of the plants, and that's critical for any kind of, you know, whether it's a pest or non-pest, uh, uh, management uh, is, you know, knowing what you're looking at. So are there, is there any questions about this uh, uh, section? Because what I'm going to do next is uh, I'm going to uh, give you a, um, uh, an example of an interactive uh, uh, guide to identification of orders and then uh, some stuff about arthropod plant damage to help you if you if you do get the plant pest index to be able to utilize that and know what the terminology means okay all right <clears throat> So like I say, normally I'd use this dichotomous key if we were doing it in person. Dichotomous keys are a little bit different in that uh, uh, each step has two choices. And if you can get stuck because uh, Murphy's law of insect identification is whatever part that you need to be able to see is the one that fell off in its transit or when you collected that specimen. So if, you, if that happens, you get stuck. Whereas I'm going to show you a method called the interactive method. And, and it, it, if you can't see it, you can ignore it. It doesn't, it doesn't stump you because a dichotomous key is sequential. You have to be able to follow it through one at a time. Like I said, the Peterson's field guide is a little bit out of date now, but it is incredible the amount of information that was uh, crammed into the little book. You know, it's this is what the cover looks like now. My original one has a spiral bound on it and it's a little different cover, but it's still the same content. And a lot of that, so maybe they've changed some of the things, you know, it's a different order or whatever, but you can do a search on, on the internet utilizing the old terminology and you'll still it'll still take you to the right things but it's like say and then if you um if you have a real interest in insects this is a great uh, book to have too another one from professor cranshaw uh it's got the updated terminology and it's more like a general introductory entomology course textbook it um is one that is uh, for a college textbook, it's it's very reasonably priced. I think I've got a copy here. Let's see if I can get what the copy. Yeah, yeah, it's especially you can probably get a used uh, uh, quote unquote used one from a college course that never was open. So uh, it, it, it's uh, also if you like insects, it's a great book to have. So any questions while I get the next presentation loaded up, and we'll. Uh, we might take a little short break. We'll take a break. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think you can maybe if I get it close enough to my face. No, can't. I don't understand how these cameras work on these things very well. But what this is, uh, you might be able to. 
<laughs> no, you probably can't see it. Okay, what this is is an old screwdriver that uh, I found that uh, is about it was about 12 inches long. I cut off the damaged blade to make a little blunt probe. And people ask, well, what is what does an entomologist need with this? So uh, I probably uh, I like most all samples or uh, yard calls except for turf because a lot of times I'm, I'm asked what's the matter with my turf or the ants are killing my turf and so why would I show up with this because a lot of times I'll show up at a yard and I'll look oh uh, well maybe there's a reason why your grass is not growing it's too dry and when I initially would tell people that they would look at me like I had I could grow potatoes out of my ears because my head was full of fertilizer uh they just didn't believe it. It's like, well, I water it once a week, whether it needs it or not, type of thing. So this is a, a demonstration of what proper watering, because even on places that are really dry, usually down around by their downspout, they might have a patch of green grass. And you can go over there and at least insert it into the ground. Otherwise, you know, if you go out and physically demonstrate, well, you can't even get this probe into you know, the top inch of the soil, it's so dried out, you know, that there's a reason why your grass is not growing. And, and so just in Hello? case you. Hey, I'm good. So, How are you? Uh, uh, somebody's unmuted. Yes. Uh, can we? Okay. I think I got her muted. <laughs> so. All right. Well, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and take a, a break till eight and you can get up and get some more coffee or get rid of the coffee and get some more snacks. And and uh, yeah, it's I the I can't stop sharing. It wouldn't have mattered, uh, Catherine, because I only have it. Uh, like I said, you know, there's there's the screwdriver. I just got to get it right to the right place. And there's the camera showing it. So it's just an old screwdriver. You can make it out of anything. You want to make sure it's blunt because you, you never know. They might have something in the yard that you wouldn't want to puncture. So, and if, if the ground is moist enough, you can stick it in. It doesn't take hard any pressure at all. And it's just a really good physical demonstration because if you don't have enough moisture in that root zone for the grass, and then let alone if they've got some trees, you know, cause you got to water enough for the grass and then whatever's extra will go to the trees. You know, you, you might as well not, but. Okay. I'm not sure we can hear you. You might want to come up and talk to the hell. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, Scott. Um, break too. Yeah. So what was your question about the screwdriver? Well, you know, you said you had the screwdriver with one inch. And it sounded like you know, for that kind of size, but then when you're looking for no. no, he's just he strictly uses it as you know how far down it goes. Yeah. Determines you know if it's dry or moist. If it goes scooting in, then it's moist soil. If it, it goes in and it stops, you know, then it's dry. So that's what his purpose is behind it. No, no.
Um, I know I have a comment. I think I've got the first two versions, not the second. Yeah. Uh, I think if you just Google it, you can find it. Or you can get a hold of Scott and ask him what this says. Well, there's a second part to that. So the, book, the book itself got written and published, but not in its entire time. Yes. I don't know if you can see it any better. If I've stopped sharing it, if my picture comes in bigger with the, it's just, it can't, it, these cameras are so weird with their, um, you can't figure out, it's like it's only picking up me instead of what I'm holding. I don't know why that would be, but it's just an old screwdriver. Oh. You can make it out of anything, you know, any like a quarter inch piece of rod. And they actually, there are, uh, uh, probes made for the that purpose uh, i just am too tight to buy one myself if you take off your background it will show the whole screwdriver oh okay <clears throat> well i'd have to it'd probably take me 15 minutes to figure out how to take off my background <laughs> hey scott there's a um a question for you in chat okay <clears throat> I guess I would, I would we need to get a better ID on them. Um, the uh, they could be a woolly aphid uh, and not uh, be a, a, a mealy bug per se. Uh, uh, and yeah, just be a matter of figuring out. Uh, you know, if if it's a type of woolly aphid, then you could probably get away with just doing like a horticultural oil spray. Uh, uh, <clears throat> those can be very good. They, all they do, uh, horticultural oil is a really dilute solution of a fine oil that uh, will smother uh, insects. You know, insects have that spiracle, that uh, uh, opening to the outside that allows oxygen and in, in the air into their body and well they, it has to have some waterproofing to keep from drowning when you have a uh, say a rainstorm and uh, of course oil is going to defeat that so it would smother them so but uh, i think we'll uh, need to get like a sample of them to, to see uh, what they are in particular uh, <clears throat> Because there, there are some soft scales that are also on pines, and they, they might also be susceptible to a horticultural oil, but it, it would have to see how bad they are. Uh, and then, because a lot of times it can be difficult to treat a whole tree, you know, to get good coverage. Uh, it's, uh, it depends on how big the tree is. 
uh, I've stuck into the chat for those of you that are viewing the meeting indirectly, uh, a list of references that I find are kind of useful, uh, including the titles of some of these uh, books and some websites. And then I've also, I went ahead and just put in the Garden Insects of North America second edition plant pest list for you. Uh, so uh, Catherine can uh, then take them and, and then distribute them uh, to you um, probably through your uh, class email system. All right, well, we'll go ahead and uh, get started with the last part of the class. So one of the things uh, that is becoming more and more uh, available are interactive apps or applications that can be used with, say, a smartphone or a computer for identifying insect orders. And of course, you know, we've already gone through a lot of this, uh, you know, the first step is always going to be, well, is it an insect or not? And we talked about the, the, those characters, so we don't need to go over it again. Uh, and, you know, we probably all have done various methods to identify unknowns, you know, flipping through a guidebook. Uh, uh, there's some of the, the um, uh, other types of, of insect Guidebooks have pictorial tables of content or a thumb tab where they have, you know, uh, pictures of various orders and you can match it by how it looks. Um, you know, the dichotomous key I talked about, and then of course the interactive uh, keys, uh, sometimes are referred to as Lucid key because Lucid software uh, company was one of the first ones to uh, come out with uh, software to make this uh, relatively user-friendly to create. And uh, then, so what I'm gonna do is show you one that's available at the discoverlife.org website. Uh, this is one uh, website that's being created or, or developed uh, under the direction of Professor John Pickering from the University of Georgia. Uh, he is mainly a moth specialist, but he's partnered with other people from, you know, botanists and herpetologists and all those types of things. And, and the goal is to catalog life, essentially, uh, a very interesting project. Uh, and one of the things that they've done so far is the ID nature guides to help people do this. So uh, it's, it's a, a great place to uh, learn more about stuff. Um, actually, I will escape out of here for a second and because I, I know a lot of you folks may not be too interested in insects per se, but I, I know a lot of you probably like plants and one of the, the neater guides that they have is the one for wildflowers of North America. So you start off by going to where the ID nature guides are, and then you can click on that. And so you can go in there to the wildflowers of North America and then where you're at. So if you go to Wyoming, <clears throat> it has 822 species that they have in their uh, interactive key. So you can go through and, and input the various uh, diagnostic characters of the plant that this wildflower that you're seeing and you know like you may not know what family it belongs to so you can skip it and and that so that's what I'm going to do I'm going to demonstrate how to do this for insect orders using a diagnostic key <clears throat> so this is the one that they have for insect orders and it has 31 different orders at this time so the I like say they've done some rearranging and, and the, this uh, website has uh, kept up with the newest taxonomy. Uh, <clears throat> the great thing about the website too is if you look at these different uh, uh, diagnostic characters, if you don't know what they're talking about, you can click on it and you can get more information. Mm -hmm. 
Let's see here. Don't know why it sometimes stops on me. So um, you can also hit search at any time during your progress. So you can see what orders are being eliminated. Um, you can simplify, you can go, oh, maybe that's not what they mean and uncheck. It, it's, it's fairly user friendly. So if you get into, uh, uh, to try to identify an insect based on this, uh, like say, if at any point in time, you're confused, what are they talking about? Four pair of wings reduced to small clubs. Well, this is a very small, strange order of insects called the Strepsiptera. And only the males have wings and they're called, uh, the common name are twisted wing parasites. And their front wings are reduced into these little knob structures and their hind wings are like this. So you can click on that and it brings up this information. And, and the, um, uh, the females are internal parasites of larger flying insects such as the wasps and some beetles. And so the only part of the female insect that's outside of that uh, host is the end of her abdomen. And so it's available for reproduction by the males once they leave a host to, to find it. Just a, a odd thing to start the key with, but certainly if, you, if your insect has these diagnostic characters, that's probably all you need to input and you would uh, be done. So uh, again, I'm going to make a, a kind of a demonstration. Uh, I get lots of photo submissions and many times that's all I need if they're good photos in focus. And so say somebody sends me a picture of this uh, uh, creature, you know, eating their pear. Uh, well, number one, you got to figure out, is this an insect? Can I use this key? And so it's got a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. You can even see segments on the abdomen. Uh, there are wings, and it has three legs on this side. You've got to assume there's three on that side, and antenna. It has all the major characters of an insect. So we can use this. <clears throat> so then you uh, can uh, then go through these stages, and I'll just kind of follow along. Like I say, you don't have to do se sequential. You can jump around for what you can see from the photos. And so in this case, yes, it has four wings. You can actually see the tips of the wings. You can see kind of the how they, uh, the shading as they overlap each other, um, the wing shape. Again, many times wings can be very important uh, features. Uh, you know, certainly these are not narrow. They're not fringed. If you clicked on this, this would be like uh, the, uh, uh, the thrips. They have very... Uh, almost like feather-like tiny wings. Um, so again, uh, you know, and if you, if you don't know or can't really make the judgment, you just uh, uh, skip it. And so you can go down here to wing develop. Yes, they are very well developed and functional. You can keep on going and it, like at any time, if you want to do a search, you can do that and it will eliminate uh, the, the orders that uh, don't have the diagnostic characters that you've already input. So uh, its front legs, four legs, are not modified for seizing prey. So it's not like a praying mantis and there's no swelling on there. So you're going along, you're, you're reading each one of these things. And if, if your specimen has okay, those characters, you can utilize it. Hind legs are not like a grasshopper. So they're not enlarged for jumping you know, like a cricket or a grasshopper. Um, they're, they're essentially same and similar in structure as the uh, mid and foreleg. <clears throat> uh, again, lots and lots of characters, really nice scientific illustrations in this key too. So uh, the antenna, long and thread-like, that's a, a good character here. And you, know, you have all the variations of antenna that you might run into. Uh, the mouth parts, obviously it's chewing on this pear. It has external with chewing mandibles. So it's not a piercing sucking mouth part. It's not sucking juices out of this pear. Um, palps, I didn't talk about palps as a diagnostic character, but they can be uh, they're usually totally absent on the beak uh, insects, the ones that have only a piercing sucking beak, uh, but chewing insects often have it because they can be utilized for tasting. So grasshoppers and like this particular beast has palps. Body regions, yeah, head, thorax, and abdomen are, are apparent. Um, body segmentation may not be apparent on some things, you know, say like on a, a scale insect. Uh, 
broad and flattened. That looks like a good match. Uh, the pronotum, uh, you'd, you'd probably need to click on this and it would explain what the pronotum is. And so in this case, this photo, actually its head is kind of uh, reared out and exposed. But it, in many cases, these insects carry their head kind of back under this shield called the pronotum. An abdominal base. Now you can see it's it's fairly wide. It doesn't have the wasp waist, so it's not uh, a member of Hymenoptera. Uh, Circe. Again, you can click on these. So sometimes insects have absolutely no Circe or projections off the end of the abdomen at all, and others uh, will. Uh, and in this case, we can see Circe coming off there. <coughs> and abdominal apex. So we don't have filaments coming off of our particular insect or pincers like a earwig. It just has a rounded end. So by going through that, as you click on that, it's eliminating orders. And so then we come to find out that our insect is Blatteria, which is the new a, uh, name for uh, the order that belongs, the, the cockroaches belong to. They actually think they're relatives now of the uh, uh, termites uh, long, long time ago. Um, again, the, uh, this is uh, the American cockroach. You can see here, this is a pin specimen versus what we've got here eating our pear. Now, I recently uh, did some of this with a piece of software to create a, um, a common vegetable and fruit Pests. Uh, so essentially asparagus, beans, carrots, uh, parsley, cilantro, those types of things, same way. So if you know your crop, then you can go in there and say, okay, I have tomatoes. Or, uh, they're actually something's chewing into the fruit and boring into the fruit. So that would eliminate many of our leaf feeding pests. And it, you, you'd find out, okay, by inputting these, uh, this damage, you would identify your potential pests. Um, again, uh, there's a, a lot of other tools out there for identification. There's um, efforts on artificial intelligence uh, and utilizing images. Uh, I have seen some success messing around with uh, uh, ones where you can take a photo and it will sort through there. It, they, generally, those do better with flowers. There's been more work on getting, you know, the picture of the flower, uh, showing all of the parts. And uh, there are some artificial intelligence uh, programs out there that can make a, a pretty good guess. But, uh, you know, I always fear about uh, these things is um, sometimes they're not comprehensive. And you, uh, you know, if, if you think, well, it's got to fit in this, you know, this, this round peg's got to fit in the square hole. If I just pound it in, it's going to work. Uh, you know, you might not uh, know that there are some uh, rare or unusual options, but uh, another great place that's really worthwhile visiting, and it's included in the insect and, and their relatives information sources, is bugguide.net. Now they may that may sound hokey, but it's actually uh, run out of Iowa State University. It's a great resource. It's a, a way of citizens contributing to science because as you take pictures, you need to register. You can submit pictures, and then uh, there's a lot of uh, amateur or professional experts. Uh, uh, that can do ident identifications. Now sometimes you can't identify stuff with just a picture you have to do in the case of some of the um, uh, little maws and stuff like that you actually have to do dissections and look at uh, internal genitalia and all that sort of stuff but there are a lot of things that you can identify from photos and that creates a huge database for scientists as, as far as where do these species occur what is the seasonality are these uh, species expanding or are they uh, declining so again so here it, there's a lot of the stuff is on insects but not just insects so you have uh, all the subphylums uh, that includes the crustaceans, and of course the subphylum hexapoda, 
six uh, includes the insecta, but that also includes other things that are um, not considered insects, but they're considered relatives. Uh, uh, again, you know, just really, uh, whoops, uh, a great resource. And if you're if you're into bugs, it's a great place. It's also good when if you're using one of these tools to identify an insect, you can go here and and then check it so you know if you uh let's say well the 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 key said it was a blateria so you could go here and you can get to that either on this clickable guide if you actually have the website up uh, or you can even put it into the search function go blateria and bring it up and say oh yeah okay it's right yeah so it would be it would take you here here's another blaterian so <clears throat> So, any questions about identifying insects? Uh, you know, again, like I said, uh, some of the things um, you know, are really useful references uh, on garden insects, or in the case of trees and shrubs. I don't know if you can see this. It's also included in your list. Uh, this is not available in, in hard copy anymore, but it's available as a PDF for download. Insects and Diseases of Woody Plants in Colorado. Uh, it's a... Um... <laughs> I'll have to turn off that uh, daggone background in the future, but it's, uh, it's a great book. It's also included in that reference list that I've given you. It has the plant pest index. Both of these have plant pest index. So if you're dealing with an aspen tree, you can go there and then based on the symptoms of what's happening to that tree, you can uh, identify the pests. So, so any questions on that? I have another, uh, I think it'll be useful. Um, presentation for you and that is on the arthropod plant damage because like say the terminology that's used in say the plant pest index uh, I'll, I'll give you pictures and then explain the terminology so Hmm. <clears throat> okay. So notice I didn't use insect plant damage, I used arthropods, so we could include other things that cause uh, plant damage like uh, mites. So again, you've seen this picture already. The insect mouth parts determine plant damage type. So you're not going to see the leaves shredded uh, if piercing sucking mouth parts are being uh, used on it. Uh, conversely, if you see uh, like a house fly resting on a plant or maybe even uh, uh, sopping up some of the honeydew from aphids, you'll know that they're not going to be causing mechanical damage to that leaf. So this is pretty straightforward. Like I said, uh, the uh, order Coleoptera, the beetles, they have chewing mouth parts, both as adults and as larva. In this case, this is the Colorado potato beetle. And then this is the larva of them. Uh, again, so you can see the type of damage. You know, you, In some cases, uh, insects will make very distinct damage and feed only in a certain way. Others will be you know, chomping on it uh, uh, in, in sometimes causing what are called shot holes, uh, uh, chewing on the, the edges. Um, again, here's an example, the root weevil adults, the black root weevil, lilac root weevil, um, they make very distinctive little kind of square-sided notches into leaves like these peonies. And uh, often they are nocturnal. And so you won't see the insects that are doing this damage. Uh, you'll have to, you could scrape away the leaf litter underneath the plant or put out pitfall traps to, to see these things. But a lot of times, you know, you can kind of say, well, the teeth marks look like this. And they, they would be distinguished from other things that would feed on the plants 
Um, the, the root weevils, in many cases, um, leaf feeding, it can be tolerated fairly well by plants. You know, they uh, have uh, often an excess of leaf tissue. Uh, it kind of is an insurance plan, but if anybody who's grown tomatoes or um, like uh, uh, grapes in a vineyard, uh, they do some pretty heavy pruning on plants. So they put most of their uh, energy into uh, the fruit production and not sustaining leaves that are not uh, being effective uh, in photosynthesis. The problem with, uh, uh, say, these root weevils is the larva feed on the roots. And so this can be very damaging to the plant uh, from the aspect of uh, uh, interfering with water uptake and then also uh, the wounds allowing the invasion of uh, pathogens into the plant. So again, uh, it's good to identify what you've got because you know like say if, if it was just the little leaf notching on the edges you could just ignore it but in many cases with say the root weevils it's very hard to establish new transplants in areas uh, that you know if you bring in a plant that's susceptible to them and you're near a lilac hedge that's you know just infested with lilac root weevil well despite their common name they don't just chew on the roots of lilacs. Uh, they will chew on other things. So a big established edge of lilac might be able to tolerate them, but a new transplant with a limited root system may die from it. Uh, leaf cutter bees. So they make very distinctive uh, uh, feeding, uh, well, not feeding, uh, just cutting on the leaves because they're not actually eating the leaves. They're using the leaf fragments to make um, uh, nests for their larva. And so each one of these little uh, leaf fragment chambers, uh, usually inserted into say a hole or a, a hollow stem uh, is provisioned with a ball of pollen and nectar and then the female lays an egg on it. And that will feed that uh, uh, larvae until it's ready to pupate and become an adult. Uh, so they make the ovals are the sides and then they cap it with a nice round uh, chunk of leaf. And they do have preferences for certain plants. And uh, uh, they can sometimes uh, do quite a bit of damage on, say, uh, roses or, or honeysuckle and sometimes lilacs. Generally, you can give them a pass because, you know, this leaf has been reduced, but it's not been killed. It's not been removed from the plant. This one's been pretty heavily damaged. But skeletonize. Leaf feeding is, in this case, uh, I call them the picky eaters of the insect world. So they're feeding on the tender uh, tissue in between the, the veins. And so that's what we call skeletonizing. This is alfalfa uh, weevil larva. Uh, alfalfa is a major cash crop for farmers in Wyoming and alfalfa weevil is one of the major pests of the particular plant. Heavy feeding damage can occur not just on leaves, and in some cases, you know, uh, it, at this point in time on a corn uh, plant, you know, you may not really care what happens to the plant as long as the, the ears are uh, filled out and are healthy and good to go uh, for your own consumption or taken to a farmer's market. Or, uh, but in, you know, grasshoppers can often chew on uh, the uh, heads of uh, wheat. They'll clip wheat and other small grains. They'll chew on the corn, uh, usually up here where they can get through the leaf sheath more easily and cause damage. And so you're probably not going to get much for that uh, ear if that was sweet corn at the farmer's market. <laughs> Fouling and shot holes. So in some cases, it's not just the leaf feeding, but they're also uh, defecating a lot as they feed. And that is uh, into you know, the plant leaves. And of course, uh, if it's on say uh, lettuce or, or some other leafy green that you wanna eat, that's not very uh, appetizing. And uh, shot holing is, occurs when the larva uh, will chew directly into the plant uh, or make a pierce a hole through it. Uh, in the case of corn, European corn borer will ch chew through those leaves that are kind of uh, wrapped around the stalk. And then, then as the leaves unfold, you'll see the evidence of the holes, the entry holes that they've made into the stalk. So then now the larvae are inside the uh, stalk. 
uh, leaf surface feeding. Sometimes uh, insects will feed just say on the top of the surface down to the bottom surface, but leave it intact. Now in our dry climate, a lot of times that will uh, flake away. And so it could appear as shot holing. But in this case, it is, uh, uh, these are cabbage white butterfly larvae. Uh, these, uh, this is not uh, frass or the feces of these things. They, uh, many of the caterpillars will turn around and eat their old exoskeleton, but they don't for some reason. And so these are, uh, when they molted to grow, uh, they have to molt, even though they have kind of a soft leathery exoskeleton, they still have to molt and uh, they, they don't uh, turn around and feed that. There's a really great program uh, recently uh, about butterflies uh, called Butterfly Blueprints on PVS Nova that's worth looking up and watching if you uh, like those types of things. Uh, they're interesting creatures. Uh, the, some of the stuff, you know, the plant defenses, uh, plants are not passive. In some cases, they have trichomes and other uh, structures that can cause problems for uh, insects. Uh, uh, again, you know, the leaf, uh, a lot of times leaves are rough. Uh, they, they might have physical defenses that help uh, maybe entangle or uh, uh, are hard to digest for the insects. Here's a case, the Mexican bean beetle uh, feeds on the undersides of leaves. So you could go out in your garden and maybe initially you wouldn't see any effect on the surface of the leaf. You'd have to turn it over and look at the larva feeding underneath. And you might recognize the body form of the beetle of the adult, the Mexican bean beetle. Uh, they are, uh, uh, I guess you could consider them a black sheep of the lady beetle family, the coccinellidae. Most of the lady beetles are predatory on plant feeding insects, but not so the Mexican bean beetle. Defoliation and silk tint. Sometimes, you know, the defoliation is just part of the uh, issue here we have the western tent caterpillar that in some years can be pretty numerous and uh, as the, they hatch from egg masses uh, placed in the previous year they have one generation per year and then as the caterpillars grow and feed they produce a silk tent which is kind of a retreat they can go into uh, during the day to help protect them from predators and storms and stuff and then they gather together uh, for defense. Uh, the hair is not like, it's not a terrible uh, stinging hair like some of the caterpillars have, uh, but it's not uh, easy to eat either. There are some birds that are not uh, very well adapted to feeding on them. And, and so there, that is a pretty good defense, but that's what the little moth looks like. You've probably all seen these. And the nice thing about it is they, um, one generation, so one uh, defoliation early in the season. This is um, a wax current up at Kirk County State Park uh, where they defoliated fairly heavily in the region of this silk tent that's now just a mass of frass and old uh, fibers here. And, and you can see here at the end of the season, uh, you know, not knowing what had happened, you, you really wouldn't uh, think that the plant was harmed and and the plants are fairly well adapted to it if it goes on year after year complete defoliation yeah it's going to hurt the plant's uh, ability to uh, cope but yeah in, in this case it's you know a minor inconvenient for the plants uh, sometimes you get plant tissue discoloration uh, the thrips will do that with their little tiny mouth parts uh, flower thrips, uh, you, if you see uh, on the colored petals of a flower, some discoloration and, and scarring, that's usually uh, Western flower thrips. Uh, the other thing on the plant tissue itself, uh, they produce kind of a black liquid uh, tarry uh, frass and, and can be, um, you know, that's another thing. If uh, the thrips can fly with their little feather-like wings as adults, the uh, uh, nymphal stages cannot. You can also have silk present in leaf discoloration that helps distinguish this from say thrips and this is caused by spider mites and so that silk production is what would give them the name. You, can, you can't quite see it in the resolution of this photo but this entire leaf surface in the, and across the edges is covered with uh, silk and, and of course, if they feed on the fruit, that's really damaging. 
Stu two spotted spider mites have a very broad host range. Uh, these are spider mite eggs. They can also reproduce very rapidly. Leaf curling and distortion. So uh, there are aphids and there are species of thrips and plant mites that as they feed, they inject chemicals into the leaf tissue and cause uh, curling and, and essentially they make a nice little sheltered home for themselves by modifying that leaf tissue. It makes it also tougher for their predators to get to them, it protects them from extremes of weather. You know, uh, aphids are fairly uh, fragile insects and so a driving rainstorm or a hose uh, can often wash off a lot of them. So this protects them. Uh, the piercing and sucking of plant cell contents uh, by true bugs, the hemipterans. Uh, there are uh, many stink and, and plant bugs. Stink bugs are pentatomyids. There are some predatory stink bugs that are good, um, like the two-spotted stink bug. Uh, they go after the uh, uh, Colorado potato beetle uh, readily. And then plant bugs, the family Myridae. Uh, this is one I don't, I've not had it submitted to me in, from Wyoming yet, but the uh, uh, brown marmorated stink bug will probably get here eventually. And it is a pest that can feed on a lot of different plants and will feed on developing fruit and young fruit trees and, and those types of things with a piercing sucking beak and suck the cell contents out. Sometimes they don't really do a lot of physical damage to the plants as they feed. They just are sucking on the phloem, but they can transmit diseases uh, um, like the uh, Pierce's diseases on grape vines. So Pierce's disease is transmitted by the glassy wing sharpshooter, an insect that gets its name sharpshooter because its defense is to shoot globs of, of um, uh, phloem uh, or honeydew out of its butt at potential predators. And that's why it's called the sharpshooter. But it uh, carries this uh, bacterial disease that native grapevines don't die from, but uh, like the French wine grape varieties do die from it. And unfortunately, they, this uh, southeastern United States native range insect found its way to California. And uh, they're trying some eradication efforts. And, and uh, because it's such a high value crop, they're trying a lot to keep it from being worse than it is for the growers. Hey, Scott. Yes. We got a question here on what is the best way to get rid of spider mites on roses? <laughs> yeah, what, what, what I did was get rid of the rose. <laughs> they, uh, it's a continual battle and it, it just goes, you know, they're so tiny and you just think, well, I got good control. Say uh, like insecticidal soap can work pretty good on them, but it is, um, it would be a continual battle. You know, you're, you're going to um, not get 100% uh, control. And when it comes to the time of year, you know, say uh, uh, usually it's uh, summertime when plants get hot and stressed, uh, then that's really good for the mites and their population will explode. And so um, you, you'll just have to keep after them if you uh, want to keep your roses happy because it is difficult. Um, yeah, hard scale insects, talked about them a little bit already. So they don't produce honeydew. And most of them, uh, they, they overwinter as eggs under the body of the mother. So you can kind of see here, that was the body of the mother. And then she secreted this uh, uh, kind of a hard waxy substance that's hollow underneath. And that's where the eggs were kept over the winter. And I need to get a better of picture of the uh, little crawlers. I've, I have yet to time it just right to get a good picture and they're so tiny, they're hard to get a picture. But uh, this is what the female scale looks like. The adult males are actually winged, only have two wings, uh, but I don't think you'll confuse them with a uh, dipteran. Uh, but again, they are uh, uh, difficult pests. They'll get on fruit occasionally. You wouldn't think that would be a very good place to be because you know the fruit's gonna fall off the plant, but maybe they don't know that. The soft scales, they again are talked about that. They attach to the plants with the mouth parts and feed on the phloem. 
uh, cottony maple scale, another example of a pretty poor common name because I think it's over 120 different plants that they will feed on, not, not just the uh, trees in the genus Acer. So um, striped pine scale is one. Uh, uh, if I hadn't seen yellow jackets coming to feed on the uh, honeydew produced by them, I would have thought uh, this is just some like a little bud or something, some growth on the uh, a pine tree that I was looking at. Leaf miners are interesting little creatures. Um, certainly the spinach leaf miner is one that's probably the worst problem for uh, gardeners because a lot of people don't like to eat uh, insects. And so uh, if you have them in your uh, leafy greens, you know, you pretty much can't get out of them you know you know the you can't wash them off or anything like that they're inside there but just think it's they're pretty much 100 percent the uh leaf that they were feeding on but uh, they are flattened dorsal ventrally from top to bottom and they can fit in between the leaf surfaces and they'll just mine in through there and you can kind of see here where they go through and they as they get bigger they make a bigger mine and then uh, when they become adults they are they're normal shaped. Uh, you can have, there's beetles that are leaf miners and there's true flies or leaf miners. And there's also some of the lepidopteran caterpillars that are leaf miners, usually tend to form leaf miners uh, where they kind of puff out the, the leaf and live in that. Arthropod caused galls. So there are um, uh, insects that cause galls on the stems of plants. Uh, leaves of plants. There's also some of the uh, little mites that do this. Uh, in many cases, the uh, mites are really tiny, and most of them are in the, the family Eriophyidae. And there's a, a good old reference that was done by the USDA a long time ago that had good color plates. Uh, and the way they did it was they identified the mites by the form and shape and host plant. Uh, that was easier than trying to identify them otherwise, because uh, actually you have to use a compound microscope in order to see the diagnostic characters on the, these little tiny mites that modify the plant tissue. It is kind of interesting how they can uh, do this and, and you know, make a home and drastically alter the form of the thing. This is my favorite kind of gall. Uh, this is called the wool sower gall. It doesn't occur here in Wyoming. I just think of this, I always look at that and I think of Dr. Seuss. If Dr. Seuss uh, uh, created a gall, the gall would look like this. So, because it, it <laughs> white with pink polka dots. So, uh, you can also have uh, on hey, some Scott, of them. Yeah. Scott, yes. the question is, what's the definition of a gall? A gall is uh, an enlarged malformed plant tissue. Um, they can be uh, various types. I should get more pictures of them like finger galls, or in this case, this is blister galls. Um, there, you can also have uh, stem galls. Um, there are, um, yeah, it's uh, petiole galls. Uh, it, it all depends on the tissue that uh, the uh, arthropod attacks and then the form of the gall. It can be uh, like say a blister form where it's uh, raised and lumpy. Um, uh, there are some that, um, you know, like say, there's a lot of different ones. I, I just recently uh, saw a, uh, it's a, I think it's a PBS, uh, deal on YouTube called Deep Look, and they did one of them on oak galls. There's a lot of different gall insects. Usually there are cynipids, but there are some others. Cynipids are a type of uh, hymenopteran. And on a single oak tree, there could be uh, like six different species farming different galls on the tree. And for the most part, <clears throat> it, and it's fortunate because they're really difficult to kind of control because, you know, they're inside the plant tissue or surrounded by the plant tissue, um, but they don't, I mean, they're stealing some of the leaf's effective area, but um, most plants tolerate them. You know, they have enough excess leaf tissue that they can survive just fine and they don't disrupt or kill the whole leaf. But yeah, a gall is just, a, you know, a modified tissue. Now there are some diseases that can also cause 
malformed tissue. And so you need to be able to distinguish that. And like I said, there's a, I, I, I included in that list of references, uh, the, the old ESDA publication, it's out of print a long time ago, but they are, uh, have made it available online as a PDF. And it, it just includes the area of fired might caused galls. So there's lots of different galls out there. That's where, um, uh, like the bugguide.net is a good one for identifying some of those things, you know, because you can uh, get on there and do a search for galls. And there are several orders that have uh, of insects that can cause galls. Uh, spittle bugs is not really a gall, but they will feed on the plant tissue with piercing sucking mouth part as an immature, and they create this, uh, uh, with the plant sap, they create this ball of mucus uh, bubbles over the top of them as a protection. You can generally hose them off with a garden hose. Um, they're not too damaging. Stem borers are very damaging because they can kill, say, like the main stem on a young sapling, or in the case of European corn borer, they can get in there and feed in the stalk or feed in where the stalk and the corn ear are attached and interfere with uh, the, the filling out of the corn. Uh, the stem, rose stem girdler on red raspberry is a bad one because it will kill the entire uh, stalk of the uh, raspberry above where it has entered the plant. So the egg of the rose stem girdler uh, uh, comes from a small, pretty little metallic wood boring beetle uh, that hatches and goes into the, un underneath the, the bark on that cane and then girdles it. It goes, does two or three loops around and essentially that girdles the, the, and kills the cane. And then it chews into the pith and goes back down into the living section. And then that's where it will pupate. Very difficult to control. White pine weevil damage is one very distinctive where, so the larvae are feeding on the interior of these uh, new growth and they cause what's called a shepherd's crook. And the, a lot of times, you know, they're not, they're usually not too big of a problem in the native forest, but say if you, uh, where I've had lots of inquiries is uh, in say in the Cody region or the Star Valley region where people move into those and are close to the native forest and they have uh, say transplanted conifers in for landscaping on their uh, yards. And so those are, you know, kind of stressed anyway, uh, you know, they have limited root system and they seem to be a magnet for the white pine weevil. And then they lay their eggs into it. A terrible pest in a, a Christmas tree plantation. Emerald ash borer, um, so far uh, hasn't been found here. Closest would be uh, the front range of Colorado. And uh, I think uh, North Platte, Nebraska. The uh, beautiful insect, uh, they use a purple, um, either a sphere or a, a, you know, a, an object hung up there that's the same color as this purple abdomen with stick them on it. And, and that's a, how they can monitor for its presence is uh, the males are attracted to that purple because the females will flash their wings and, sh and show off that iridescent purple abdomen. And then, you know, if you if you find males, you know, there's females in the area. So they uh, feed under the bark of ash trees uh, as larva. And of course, that will girdle the tree eventually. It usually takes them two or three years to kill a tree. Uh, starting at the top and working their way down. Uh, if a tree is initially infested uh, and caught early, you can utilize systemics uh, to uh, try to uh, uh, protect that tree. And in towns, uh, that's a possibility for protecting ash trees. Uh, but in nature, uh, you know, the, our ash is in the forest or not going to fare too well. The, uh, yeah, another one, you know, borers uh, can be really damaging. Uh, most of our native borers have enough uh, parasitoids and predators that go after them that they're not a major problem. Now, when you get an introduced pest like the Asian longhorn beetle, uh, it is 
a real problem because uh, you know it, it it feeds in an area so protected inside the uh, branches of living trees uh, that it's um, yeah it it's it's escaped uh, quarantine in several places. Uh, I think they recently found a fairly large outbreak in South Carolina, but it, it affects many different of our hardwoods besides maple. Maple is preferred, but it can attack uh, these others. One I get a lot, especially when we had the uh, murder hornet scare, uh, was the horn-tailed wasp, or the specifically uh, pigeon tremex is the one that's usually fairly common in Wyoming towns because uh, you know, usually there's always a, a cottonwood that's uh, dead or dying and uh, or has a big dead, uh, freshly dead branch. And that's what they search out and they lay their eggs under the bark and then the larvae go down and feed on that freshly dead wood with, uh, uh, they usually inoculate it with some fungi that helps break down the wood. And uh, again, uh, they're not a tree killer. They're, uh, they kind of come in afterwards. Bark beetles, yes, they are a major uh, uh, tree killer. Uh, it, most all trees have species of uh, beetles, uh, uh, scolitids that uh, will feed under the bark and damage the cambium layer and can kill the tree. Uh, mountain pine beetle is one that can have uh, you know huge outbreaks uh, in forests and cause significant uh, damage. You know in damage within our lifetime you know these are uh, these particular ones mountain pine beetle is a native insect and uh it probably just with our you know the way the forests were with uh, the way it was managed after uh, you know the logging that went on in the pioneer days you know uh, you had a lot of regrowth that came back uniform age and then was very susceptible when drought hit in the early 2000s for a big outbreak of mountain pine beetle in our region. So again, these are great books. I, I tried to show you the pictures of it. They're available um, you know, online as a PDF. It's not available in hard copy anymore. Um, this is a pretty reasonable price book from Colorado State. Uh, their bulletin room is not as easy to navigate as it once was before the pandemic, but I think you can still get it or find it used online. Uh, so it's a, these are great books to have. So we're about out of time. I do have a, a photo quiz. I should make everybody put into the chat box who's online and then have Catherine uh, raise their hand. So, um, <clears throat> okay, the insect, this is a crested wheatgrass. And you can see that the leaves are not healthy at all. And it, it taken, looking at them closely and taking some photos, you see two insects here. This one, everybody should recognize what that is. This is a little nymph grasshopper, early in star, early stage, close to being out of the egg. They do eat grass, but they have chewing mouth parts. Over here is a hemipteran. Can't really see all the diagnostic characters, although you can see one, two, three legs on this side and a beak coming down here. So which one of these insects is causing this extensive damage on the crested wheatgrass? Anybody, you can put it in there. <laughs> so. We're leaning towards the, the little insect on the left side. Yeah, this it's kind of an interesting one. This is a, a black grass bug. It is a native true bug, uh, it, you know, having a piercing sucking beak from the order Hemiptera uh, that sucks the juices out of many grasses, um, many of our native species. It, it explodes in the uh, intermediate and crested wheatgrass fields. I, I think my theory on it is it leaves behind, uh, say, predators and parasitoids that are, keep it under control in native prairie where there's a mixture of uh, not just a monoculture of its host plant. And, and this one, a lot of times it is interesting. It uh, feeds very early in the season 
uh, you can see it in many of the highway right of ways where you normally, you know, you're having a green spring and you come along and it's like, well, that, that wheatgrass looks all bleached out and it won't head or anything like that. And these things will feed uh, with such uh, intensity, you know, they suck the, all the green cell contents out. So essentially that, that plant is hardly getting any nutrients. And if you tried to make hay out of it, it would be just cellulose and lignin and it wouldn't be very good hay even. Uh, they've actually in Nebraska, in Western Nebraska, they've had uh, 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 crested wheatgrass seed fields uh, that are heavily damaged by these things. Uh, um, so yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting. This is a native insect that's a, a extreme pest of a introduced grass. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of funny. Yeah. So with that, I guess if there's uh, uh, any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. I will unshare here. And um, again, you know, I, I guess I'm getting kind of chicken in my old age. I didn't want to drive over and uh, get stranded on the road. <laughs> well, don't, we don't blame you, Scott. Not at all. Yeah, it's. Uh, I saw all day I-25 north of Cheyenne has been uh, closed. It must be a terrific blowing snow up that direction. Lots of wind. Mm -hmm. Lots of wind. Well, any other questions or yeah, David. Mm -hmm. Tomato hornworm. Yeah. So Scott, did you hear that? In in Missouri, they have a an insect or worm that or larva that will girdle the base of a tomato plant and cause it to fall over. Oh, really? Yeah, we, we don't have anything like that here. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we don't. Yeah, that. so that would be a very interesting one. So uh, like I said, the, that plant pest index, I would have to look at it to see, because it's not just for our region. It was kind of, you know, like say North America. And, and so then you would get into there and look under the uh, uh, tomato, uh, uh, probably, I'm not sure you'll ha have to use your knowledge of plants. So, cause sometimes they use the scientific name of that plant group. So I think, you know, the uh, what, tomatoes and tomatillas and stuff like that, uh, nightshades, uh, you know, uh, solanaceous type plants, you might have to look and see, okay, is there a girdler, you know, what, uh, uh, what one, I know there are some cutworms that will, um, you know, a lot of cutworms, not particularly fond of these solanaceous plants, but there are some that can tolerate them in subterranean cutworm. Maybe it's uh, one of the species there. We, we generally just have things like the army cutworm is our major pest uh, in, in like our field crops, small grains, alfalfa, those types of things. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions? Well, you're, you're all welcome. Like I say, I am also a resource. It's uh, my name's on that list. And, you know, through Catherine, uh, there's also, um, you know, the, uh, like I say, you know, I, I like insects and I like books just as much as insects. So I have lots of stuff. I just got a, a new book. Um, it's The Common Spiders of North America. Really a wonderful book. Uh, great photography in it. So, yeah. You'll have to share that title with us because that's uh, got my, my interest too. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, by Sarah Rose and it's another one that's pretty reasonable for the quality of it. Uh, it was actually made, instead of being made in China too, it was printed in Italy. It's too bad we can't print them here. Let me grab it and I'll show you the picture of it. What was your question? Yep, especially if you've got spider mites. Yep, yep, oh yeah, absolutely. So is that a Joro spider? Yeah, I, I, I don't, 
well, it's new enough. I didn't have it on the um, uh, the list, but yeah, it's uh, it just came out in July of 22, and uh, I just ended up uh, being able to pick up a copy here, and yeah, just really, uh, if you if you like the creepy crawlies, you'll love this book. <laughs> All right, Scott, we appreciate your time and information. It's always, to, I always learn something. Well, at least good. I, off. I, I'm, I'm always happy uh, to help and, and uh, be a resource for you and appreciate your work with the honeybees and stuff like that. It's uh, always a, a great, and you have big classes too. Yes, I do. <laughs> All right. Well, good night, everybody that's online. Bye.